is a CBC News special presentation. And good morning from the nation's capital, where today Canada will mark the arrival of its next governor general. Julie Payette will take over from David Johnston in a ceremony steeped in tradition, music, military honors, and lots of symbolism. The Governor General is the Queen's representative in Canada. It's sort of a big deal. She's also Canada's head of state and, uh, for those of you who don't know, Canada's Commander-in-Chief. There have been, to date, 28 GGs in Canada's history. Only three of them were women. But after today, Ceremony Payette will be the fourth and the 29th Governor General of Canada. That's Parliament Hill on a lovely fall day, but just here, this is a scene at Rideau Hall Gate. Governor General designate, as we are going to call her, uh, until she officially is sworn in or um, appointed into her position. Julie Payette, she is inside uh, with her son, 14-year-old Laurier. With her inside Rideau Gate is Heritage Minister Mélanie Joly and the Secretary to the Governor General, Steve Wallace. In about 15 minutes or so, they will leave in that car there uh, for Parliament Hill. David Cochran is keeping watch at that location. We'll be back to him in just a moment. I should point out that Judy Payette is staying at Rideau Gate until some uh, renovations are done inside Rideau Hall. Good morning. I'm Rosemary Barton here from Ottawa. Thanks for joining us today on what will be one of those uh, classic Ottawa days full of, uh, full of ceremony, lots of politicians, and uh, lots of excitement too on this, the uh, official installation of the Governor General. I'm going to say that correctly before I get corrected by my guest, who I'll bring in in just a moment. And while it is a big day here in Ottawa, there is of course lots of developing news uh, happening around the world and in particular today in the United States. Overnight, that country had its worst mass shooting in U.S. history in Las Vegas. The number of dead in that instance is still rising and throughout the next few hours as we tune into our special coverage of the installation of the next Governor General, we will also keep watch on that important story in the United States. So let's begin there with the CBC's John Northcott who's in Toronto with the very latest. John. Thanks, Rosemary. Rosemary. We begin with the latest from Las Vegas, where a grim record has been broken. Another mass shooting, this one now the worst in U.S. history. An eerie quiet as the sun comes up over the city known for its nightlife. About 12 hours ago, the fun was shattered by rounds and rounds of deadly gunfire. We warn you, some of the images that we're going to show you, you may find upsetting. That's just one of dozens of videos posted online. In all of them, you can hear long bursts of gunfire ring out as country star Jason Aldean keeps performing until people in the crowd realize those bullets are raining down on them. We now know that the gunman identified as Stephen Paddock was on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Hotel and he was firing down, sniper style, on the crowd below during the outdoor concert. The numbers of dead and injured have increased dramatically over the last few hours. The Las Vegas sheriff says at least 50 are dead and at least 400 injured. And that, the shooter killed himself before they got to him on the 32nd floor. We believe the individual uh, killed himself prior to our entry. How many weapons were you found with? Uh, we are um, still going through the uh, search warrant actively at this time, um, but it's in excess of 10 rifles. Reporter Steve Futterman is in Las Vegas and he joins us now live. Steve, let's talk about the latest. We've just heard from police. What are they saying? They are saying, as you heard, the 50 people dead, more than 400 injured. And these numbers are sadly likely to rise, especially the number of dead, because a number of those who are injured are in critical, are in serious condition. Their prognosis is is not very good for some of them right now you know it's a this is a city where people come to lose money they don't come here to lose their lives but for 50 souls at least 50 people right now that's what has happened to them the investigation goes on authorities have i believe in the last hour gone into the home of the suspect Stephen paddock we don't even have to i don't even think call him a suspect right now he was the gunman police say and they have gone into his home they are looking for anything that will give them clues as to why he did this 
Usually you can find lots of information on laptop computers, desktop computers, smartphones. So that's what they will be initially looking for. His home, about an hour and a half drive, northwest, northeast rather, of Las Vegas yeah. in Mesquite. Where, where does the investigation go from here, Steve? Well, the, the only thing they really want to find out right now is why he did it. And, of course, they do want to make sure, even though they are very certain that no one else was involved, they do want to make sure that that is indeed the case. They located, remember, a few hours ago, they were looking for a woman described as his companion and roommate. That turned out to be his wife. They have found her. She is outside of the U.S. They found two vehicles that belong to him. So they have found some of these things they were looking for. And, again, so far, it appears... It is him. He's the only suspect, the only gunman. They know that he checked into the hotel, the Mandalay Bay, which is a bit behind me. You may not be able to see it because of daylight now. But the, he checked in last Thursday. So he'd been there for a number of days, apparently planning this horrific event. We also would like to know, did he specify that he wanted this location, this room in the hotel that would overlook the concert where he committed this horrible act? Steve, this is a situation where the investigation is one thing, how people process it is another. You have yeah. been there for so many key moments in the modern American story. Where does this fit in and how do people cope moving forward? Well, I mean, they will find a way to cope to it, but this goes along with the, the Pulse nightclub massacre last year in Newtown a few years ago, just another mass American shooting, which uh, seems to happen with increasing frequency, unfortunately. This will not be the last, sadly. Hopefully, there will, this will be the, the worst ever, but you just never know. I often wondered, uh, sort of, uh, in, in my mind, whether there would ever be a gunman who would use like an automatic weapon to just cut down people. And this was that one, sadly, that actually came true. Steve, thanks so much for being there for us. Steve Futterman. Take care. Thank you. Live in Las Vegas. The U.S. president has commented on the shooting in Las Vegas. The CBC's Ellen Morrow has that part of the story, and she joins us live from our Washington bureau. Ellen, let's talk about Donald Trump and what he's saying. Well, Donald Trump tweeted this morning, John, we can show you what he posted. He wrote, my warmest condolences and sympathies to the victims and families of the terrible Las Vegas shooting. God bless you. And that's what we're hearing from various politicians here in Washington. Uh, Vice President Mike Pence tweeted nearly the same message this morning as well. Now, uh, in the past, Trump has usually had more of a political reaction to these kinds of events. If you think back to uh, that shooting at Pulse nightclub in Orlando, in June 2016, uh, Trump tweeted that he was right about what he calls uh, radical Islamic terrorism, and he sort of made his reaction about that topic. Uh, his reaction to this event is not political at all so far, and we will likely hear more of the same from him when he speaks at around 10.30, John, so just under half an hour from now. Ellen, we've seen calls for more gun control in the aftermath of Virginia Tech, in the aftermath of Sandy Hook, in the aftermath of the Orlando nightclub shooting. We are going to hear that again for certain. Uh, what can we expect about that debate and where it might go? Well, as you say, that is the inevitable conversation after any of these mass shootings, and it is likely it will come back to the fore after this one as well. We won't see Donald Trump necessarily bring it to the fore. Uh, he, of course, is a big uh, gun supporter, got a lot of votes from the NRA in the election. And right now in Congress, there is a bill that would actually make it easier to buy gun silencers. That bill was expected to pass. We'll have to see if this has an impact on it. Uh, but although this is the deadliest mass shooting in modern U.S. history. Remember Sandy Hook, 10 or 20, sorry, young school kids shot dead. That did not change things, even with Barack Obama, who did want change in office. So very unlikely any change will come as a result of this shooting either, John. Ellen, thanks for this. The CBC's Ellen Morrow, live in Washington. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau just sent out a message on Twitter. He said, words fail this morning. The friendship and support of Canadians is with the victims in Las Vegas and the people of the U.S. We'll be following this story throughout the day here on CBC News Network. But for now, back to Rosemary Barton 
in Ottawa. Rosemary? Thanks, John. Appreciate that. And as John said, we'll keep an eye on that story throughout the morning as it continues to unfold. Uh, but good morning here from Ottawa. I'm Rosemary Barton, and there is lots to watch and see over the next few hours here in the nation's capital. It is, of course, the official arrival. Installation is the official word of the new uh, Governor General, who is for now the Governor General designate, Judy Payette. A Governor General a little bit different than all the others, given her vast experience uh, and her time in space. That's not something every governor general can say. Here to help us through uh, our coverage throughout the morning is Philippe Lagasse. He's an associate professor and the Barton chair at, not related to me, at Carleton <laughs> University's Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. He is also an expert in the process, the Westminster system, uh, and, and will be able to correct me throughout the morning is basically what I'm counting on him to do. Good to see you, Philippe. Only on occasion. Thank you. <laughs> Let, let's just remind people uh, the role of the Governor General in, in this country. Yes, she is um, the head of state. The oh, Queen's... I wouldn't say that. Oh, okay, <laughs> go on. Queen's representative. Okay, start correcting me now. Here we go. So uh, that term has been used before for the Governor General, but yes. uh, technically speaking, uh, the Queen is one echelon above right. and personifies the state. So... We say head of state on Canada. So okay. I'll, I'll start with that, and that'll be my first correction of the morning. <laughs> and I'm happy to take it. I even heard you before yes. during the presentation. I, I winced a little bit, but uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let this one pass. All right. Why do we say installation? <laughs> start with, why don't you start there, too, if we're going to do a whole correct Barton a uh, few hours? <laughs> no, no. I'll stop there. I'll stop there. I'll be good. I'll okay. be good. All right. Keep... So what, what is the role of the governor general, then, other than, as you say, um, the queen's representative in Canada? Uh, well, we can divide it into, I'd say, about four Rules, but I think the most important one that uh, that we consider is the constitutional function. Mm -hmm. So that really is, uh, to your point, it, the head of state functions that the governor general performs, and that uh, therefore the governor general Payette will perform. And those are pretty wide ranging. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, the governor general is a constitutional fire extinguisher. This is a, <laughs> a, an office that that you don't really want to have to use unless it's the worst possible case scenario. Yeah. Uh, and the, the two most important powers that this individual exercises on their own uh, as an official are the appointment or a possible dismissal of a prime minister and uh, taking advice on the dissolution of parliament. Most other powers that the governor general exercises are done on the advice of the prime minister, mm -hmm. except in the most extreme circumstances. So as we look to the south, uh, the country to our south, we can imagine situations where it's good to have uh, yes. a distinction between head of government and head of state. Uh, so even in, in certain cases like that, um, you may want to have power or authority divided, even if it's between the formal and the informal. So, it, it, I mean, these are the rare, it, I mean, some of this is fairly rare. We can think back to under Stephen Harper, where there was the uh, infamous case of prorogation right. uh, with then Governor General Mikhail Jean. Dissolution of Parliament may be something more expected. Other than those things, the Governor General role is largely symbolic, is that fair to say? Um, it's very ceremonial, right? I think that's uh, that's the most important thing to point out. On top of the constitutional duties, there's all the state ceremonial functions. Which we're seeing sort of on the screen now, the beginning of that. <laughs> right. I, and the idea here, and this is what distinguishes our system, let's say, from Republican systems as in France or the United States, is that you want to have a head of state function, which is separate from head of government, that does all the things that, that are personifying the nation, that are meant to be mm -hmm. nonpartisan, not necessarily apolitical, because the office is inherently political, it's a political institution, yeah. but nonpartisan so that um, political parties or prime ministers who are, prime min who are political don't get to, to control or, or personify the state or the nation in, in most respects. Um, now, that's, that's a bit of a tension these days, and it's, uh, it's something that we're dealing with much differently from the UK because they have yeah. a monarch who reigns and therefore uh, no prime minister can, can kind of match that. But for us, it's still fairly important to have orders of Canada handed out by a governor general, not by a prime minister. Right. To have it understood that the governor general represents the, the nation, represents the state, uh, and therefore all Canadians, regardless of their political leanings. Okay, and, and, and we'll talk more about the role and, and why this choice in particular is so interesting and what she may come to, to symbolize and personify for the country throughout her time in office, which is typically about five years. But let's go inside uh, those parliament buildings where you can see the, the uh, 
the ceremonial honor guard is outside, but inside is our own Hannah Thibodeau. She is outside the Senate chamber where today's ceremony will happen, and she'll give us a sense of how that's going to unfold. Hannah. Hey, Rosie. Uh, well, look what I have in my mitts. I do have the official program now for the installation of the 29th Governor General. Uh, in this official program, which all of the guests inside will receive, you have the uh, coat of arms. It's not hers, though. Uh, this is the coat of arms of the Governor General of Canada, but they have released her new and official coat of arms, which I think we'll be able to see a little bit later. There's also a photograph, uh, her official photograph, and then finally it goes on, gives her extensive CV in here, and then the exact details of how the day will unfold. And of course, inside the chamber, there is room for about 750 guests, and Ms. Payette herself has introduced about 400 of those guests. We've seen some of them arrive so far, Rosie, including former Governors General Adrian Clarkson, as well as Mikael Jean, former Governor General. Her husband and daughter arrived. She isn't in attendance here today. There have been three premiers who have arrived so far, uh, of course, because we have the meeting of the premiers with the prime minister tomorrow. We've seen the premier of Ontario, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, as well as the Northwest Territories. Those are some of the people who have arrived so far, but also former prime minister Jean Chrétien will be in attendance as well today. Some of the guests who will be here, but of course it all gets underway and the official installation starts inside the Senate chamber in a short time from now. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Hannah. We will Wait, check back with you, of course, as people start to arrive. I'm told one of the other people that, first of all, there's a bunch of astronauts there which is who are going to arrive, which is pretty unusual for a Governor General installation, and also uh, Dick Pound, who was, of course, uh, part of the Olympics, uh, Olympics of Canada. And Judy Payette herself has played a role in particular uh, the Own the Podium program, uh, trying to push Olympic athletes to succeed. Let's go over to Rideau Gate, Rideau Hall Gate, where the CBC's David Cochran is standing by to try and catch a glimpse of the Governor General designate and her son before they take off for the hill. What's the scene there today, David? Yeah, Rosie, after listening to Professor Lagasse, I realize how little I know about our constitutional That's monarchy. That's why I invited so I'm a little him. bit nervous yeah, about what yeah. I'm I know. <laughs> so please grade me on a curve, Professor. So here's what's happened. Ju just now, David Johnston has just left Rideau Hall in his motorcade as the fi for the final time as Governor General. He's on his way to Parliament Hill, obviously, for the installation ceremony where everything will change. And right here behind us, this is Rideau Gate. This is where Julie Payette is staying in her final hours as Governor General designate. About 10 minutes or so ago, uh, Heritage Minister Melanie Jolie went inside uh, along with the uh, Stephen Wallace, who is the secretary to the Governor General. Mm -hmm. He greeted her, and she will be escorting Ms. Payette uh, to Parliament Hill uh, for the official ceremony. Now, she's in there with her son and some family members. We were speaking to her aunt very briefly as, as she, she and some of her nieces and family made her way in. And there's been a bit of a Governor General designate slumber party going on here too, Rosie, because as Hannah said, 750 people in the Senate chambers. Ms. Payette has invited 400 of those people. Some of them are staying here at Rideau gate, some an overflow at Rideau Hall, because this being such a big day, as you can imagine, a lot of friends, family and colleagues want to be here to be part of it. So this is a very precise production today. So in about 11 minutes, my, my phone says it's 1017 at 1028 Eastern. Julie Payette will leave to make her way to Parliament Hill for the installation ceremony. And I think we can we can bank on that, Rosie, because nobody wants to be late for work on your first day, especially not when you're stepping in as the Queen's representative to Canada. No, that's a good way to get fired on your first day right there. But uh, you're right. These things do have a military precision, uh, given that the governor general is also uh, the chief commander of, of the, the military here in this country. And it's part of the reason why you'll often see governor generals uh, wearing the uniforms of the Canadian forces, in fact. They mm -hmm. do have the ability to do that. Okay, David, you uh, send word if you see any movement there, and we'll check back with you in a little bit. Will do. Um, we are waiting to hear a little bit more about some of that very long guest list uh, that uh, Julie Payette has assembled. But because of her, her life and her background, she has obviously crossed the paths of many Canadians and many different kinds of people as well as an astronaut, engineer, uh, head of the Canadian Space Agency, and our own Catherine Cullen took a look at just who Julie Payette is to try and uh, give us an introduction to our Governor General designate. Here she is with that story. Julie Payette signaling uh, she is go and blowing a kiss. This was Julie Payette's dream and you can just feel her joy as it becomes reality. The final crew member to board the space shuttle today. I've been wanting to be an astronaut since I'm a little kid. 
I was growing up in Montreal in the early uh, 1970s and watching the Apollo mission, uh, the later Apollo mission, and thinking that that rover on the moon was great and I wanted to drive that. She's been to space not once, but twice. In the 90s, she was selected from a pool of more than 5,000 applicants, becoming an astronaut at the same time as Chris Hadfield. In 1999, she became the second Canadian woman to go into space on the space shuttle Discovery. I was um, happy for Julie that she's brave enough to actually go up in space. During that trip, she supervised the spacewalk and operated the Canada arm and helped build the International Space Station. With me, I am taking uh, in my heart uh, my country, uh, my people, my home, and I hope to represent them very well. We have main engine start. A decade later, she went back up again. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour. This time to live on the space station she helped build, making history with two Canadians on board at once. Living and breathing space station with six people on board, um, a, a tremendous sight. It took plenty of hard work to get there. Payette is an engineer who has her pilot's license and speaks six languages. As if that weren't enough, She's a trained scuba diver who plays piano and has sung with Montreal Symphony Orchestra. Madame Payette. And of course, she's an officer of the Order of Canada. Becoming Governor General brings a new challenge. For the chance, the amazing chance, a second chance to serve Canada again. One fellow astronaut is not worried about how Payette will manage. Now, let me see. She was on the International Space Station as the first Canadian. She did two space shuttle flights in front of an international audience of television. I don't think she's going to have a problem. Being the Queen's representative will be a very different kind of challenge. Sure. Very nice to see you. But challenges are something Julie Payette knows how to embrace. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, I hope you all feel as wildly unaccomplished as I do after watching a little bit of uh, what we know about the new Governor General, the Governor General designate, uh, Judy Payette. I should also uh, just let you in on a few f what the Rideau Hall calls fun facts. These are fun facts for Rideau Hall. She is uh, 53 years old. She is the third youngest Canadian Governor General in history. And she is the second single Governor General who will be uh, in office, her and her son. The first one was uh, Vincent Massey, who was a widow when he took office back in 1952. Okay, the new governor general also means you get some cool new equipment, sort of, things to put on your letterhead, including a new coat of arms, and they are specially designed for each governor general. And this one, if you take a look, really does reflect who Judy Payette is and what is most important to her. The first thing you might notice, uh, right at the center, is the wings. It symbolizes exploration, liberty, safety. Sounds about right. That's a nod to Payette's career as an astronaut. So to the astronaut helmet, right above the shield, that's cool, uh, said to represent, obviously, the quest for knowledge beyond the world we know. Right above that, there is a line of music to symbolize her passion and love of that. And those with a keen eye for music, that would not be me, might recognize that these are notes from Alessandro Marcello's oboe concerto in D minor, and in fact, you'll see lots of musical references over the course of the next few hours because Madame Payette is an accomplished musician. The pair of Canadian lynx holding the shield represent us, the people of Canada. They are wearing collars of stars and laurel leaves, the French translation of Laurier, the name of Julie Payette's son. At the bottom is the planet Earth. Well, that's good. Without borders, the way Payette saw it from space. And you'll see there as well the motto, per aspera ad astra, which means through hardship to the stars. It's a motto used by astronauts to symbolize that there is hope in every situation. We just need to look for it.
So that's pretty special. I just want to give you a little bit of an update on a story that we are following, of course, south of the border uh, in the United States, which overnight has marked the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. There are, at this hour, more than 50 people dead, more than 400 injured. Lots of uh, updates will come as many of these people are seriously injured and in hospital. We are expecting at 10 Theater Eastern that the President of the United States will address the United States about this mass shooting and will bring you updates and bring that to you live if we can as we bounce back and forth from an important day in this country and a tragic one in that country. Let me bring in um, our my sidekick, that's what I'm going to call him today, <laughs> Philip Lagasse, uh, who is an expert in all things Governor General, Westminster System, Queen, everything else that you need to know about how today is going to unfold. And I just wanted to go back to the fact that when the last Governor General, David Johnston, who you can see there on your screen, he actually has the third, I think it's the third longest mandate because he did stay on a little longer than the five years that normally Governor Generals get. And in your screen, you can see him arriving with his wife, Sharon Johnstone, uh, the Prime Minister, and his wife, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau. He was actually chosen, and I, I had to reread this because I had forgotten, by a selection committee that uh, Prime Minister Harper used, which the current Prime Minister did not use. Was that, do you think that that was effective in the end, that that made sense to use this kind of selection committee, or is that not kind of a typical way to go about this kind of thing? Well, I think it was a, a, a new initiative on the part of the Harper government in an effort to move away from the idea that vice regals should be either political or should not have characteristics that you'd be looking to find in, in a vice regal office. Right. Similarly, uh, the Harper government was pretty keen on having vice regal officers that were monarchists which may sound like an odd thing, but uh, there was some sense, I think, that some of the sense, vice yeah. officers were not necessarily as keen on the monarchy as they might be. Could you be talking about Mikhail Jean there, perhaps? Uh, perhaps, Adrian, <laughs> Adrian Clarkson as well. Adrian Clarkson, uh, who's actually there today right. as well, yeah. So some sense that uh, they, you wanted them vetted by, uh, by a committee that was, uh, had, had a view towards their, their particular understanding of the system and, and how well they were suited, and again, to move away from partisan political appointments um, that, that were seen, not necessarily that they were political, but that they were former mm -hmm. politicians, and therefore you wanted to expand it to a wider group of people. Now, interestingly, uh, my understanding is that that vice regal selection committee was the model that was then used for the Senate, and yet it's been uh, abandoned for uh, the vice regal mm -hmm. appointments. Mm -hmm. uh, the Trudeau government seems to now think that Vice regal appointments are better seen going back to uh, people of note in the community. Um, that, Accomplished uh, that, people, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that's really one of the main criticisms of the vice regal selection committee yeah. under the Harper government was that who were these people? Uh, they weren't as well known as they could have been. Um, and maybe uh, that that was one cr critique that could have been made. Let, let's just take a moment to, to talk about uh, David Johnston and his wife, Sharon Johnston, uh, as they get set to, to leave. Uh, they, they seem to be very well liked, uh, uncontroversial. They they promoted reading, volunteerism. Uh, they traveled not only throughout this country uh, multiple times, but he also went on many many missions around the world representing the government. Uh, and he was well liked across party lines. It wasn't. A, I mean, it was. You know, as you say, it is political, but it certainly wasn't partisan in any way. Right. Well, I think he he had the the chance as well to be in a constitutional situation, which is fairly yeah. stable. And I think that's. Yeah. The, <laughs> it does make a big difference. Uh, in, in the case of Mikhail Jean, I think uh, any of the controversy that surrounded the prorogation of 2008 was a function of how Parliament was set yep. up at the time. Um, Governor General Johnson didn't really deal with that kind of situation, and therefore it was a bit uh, easier for him, obviously. Uh, fewer demands of any kind of use of his discretion yep. in, in particular cases. Um, similarly, no call to appoint additional senators or anything like that. And in fact, uh, the one situ the one area where it might have been more controversial when Prime Minister Harper was refusing to appoint senators, mm -hmm. uh, and there was a court case in BC to attempt to say, well, this is a duty. Should the Governor General have to do this uh, even without prime ministerial advice? Those of us that are very wedded to constitutional convention recoiled in horror. <laughs> uh, but uh, regardless, this uh, that was out there as an idea. But uh, generally, a quiet, successful, very successful term for uh, David Johnson as Governor General. Uh, as you said, well yep. respected across the board. Uh, very good charitable work setting up the Rideau Hall Foundation. Yep. 
uh, and really seen as, as a bit of a model of, of how you want to act and, and behave as Governor General. And again, one thing to note with his term, getting back to the, the, one of the purposes of that Vice Regal Committee was how strongly he emphasized that he was the Queen's representative. He never had any airs of being head of state right. or of uh, having a You could sort of see in the small box there, uh, the Governor General designate Judy Payette leaving uh, with her son, Laurier. And because these things matter and because I also care, I'm told that she is wearing uh, Mary Saint Pierre, the, the Quebec, the famous Quebec designer today. Um, uh, there has been a sort of general push in political circles and diplomatic circles to promote Canadian designers, so not surprising that Judy Payette would choose a Montreal designer to do that as well. She will now make her way about 10 minutes probably with the, the escort over to Parliament Hill where you can see uh, the ceremonial guard has gathered and that of course is the uh, Supreme Court Justice Beverly McLaughlin who is arriving here because she will do the official swearing in of the new Governor General. She actually is coming to the end of her term as uh, Chief Justice and will be leaving the Supreme Court in the new year. She uh, being greeted there by Sophie Grégoire Trudeau. And that is the uh, government's representative in the Senate, Peter Harder, who will also play a role in today's ceremony. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and it's very possible that I am, but uh, Beverly McLaughlin is also the Deputy Governor General. That's correct. Right. right. So if, if the Governor General is incapacitated or something, that's when she would take over? Or how, how would that work? Right. If, if certain duties, so for instance, uh, royal assent has occasionally been granted uh, by the Deputy. Um, okay. There's kind of types of duties. Okay. In the absence altogether, there's also a, a, an administrator role, which is slightly different, but uh, as a Deputy, uh, she is able to fulfill some of those functions. Okay. And so wh what we'll see over the next couple of hours is, is not only the arrival of the new governor general designate, but this, this swearing in process. And there's a number of oaths that she has to take. I should stop saying swearing in so that you don't get mad at me. <laughs> the, end of the installation of Judy Payette. Uh, she's got three oaths, the oath of allegiance, the oath of the office of the governor general and commander in chief of Canada, and the oath of the keeper of the great seal of Canada, which is my personal favorite one because it comes with a prop, uh, an actual giant seal it's huge it's great <laughs> it's got an effigy of Queen Elizabeth it's, uh, and it has like a whole purpose it is yeah. it really it, 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 it is the the mark of Canadian state authority you can't get more constitutional nerdy than the Great Seal it's, uh, it's fantastic <laughs> all right here they are uh, entering this is uh, the Senate chambers if I'm not mistaken or are they in the rotunda let me just pull back. I guess that's the rotunda uh, inside the center block of Parliament Hill. Uh, and they will make their way uh, through those corridors and then down into the Senate chamber where the official uh, ceremony will happen. That's the Speaker of the Senate, George Fury, the Speaker of the House of Commons, Jeff Regan, um, and other official welcomes that will happen here on Parliament Hill as we wait for things to get underway. There'll be lots of, um, yes, pomp and circumstance, as is the case when you're dealing with uh, the Queen's representative in Canada, but there'll also be lots of musical numbers that we will see throughout the course of the morning, uh, all of them uh, chosen uh, or influenced by the Governor General designate, including uh, a group that she actually played with. Um, while she was, because as we've heard, she's an accomplished musician. Here they are meeting uh, Indigenous representatives of this, of this country, the AFN chief, Perry Bellegarde, the head of the Inuit Taparit Kanatami, Nathan Kobed, Obed rather, Clément Chartier, the head of the Métis Federation, the Native Women's Association, and others. Um, large indigenous component, of course, part of, part of the way things go uh, these days on Parliament Hill, given the government's commitment to reconciliation. So we are uh, standing by for uh, Judy Payette to arrive on Parliament Hill, uh, where the official ceremony will, will get underway. Let me bring you to uh, Washington. Uh, dip out of this for just a moment and bring you to Washington, D.C. That is uh, the president's podium inside the White House. We are expecting uh, President Trump to address the nation, the United States. Well, it was supposed to happen at 10.30 Eastern, obviously a little bit delayed, but he is expected to come out and uh, speak to Americans and perhaps the entire world about uh, the worst mass shooting in U.S. history, which happened overnight in Las Vegas, on the Las Vegas Strip, for people that uh, have not been following the news, the death toll, uh, over 50 people dead now, an estimated 400 people brought to hospital over the course of that evening. Uh, the suspect has been identified as Stephen Paddock, a 64-year-old man from Mesquite, Nevada. 
He killed himself when police uh, found him on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Hotel, which is where he opened fire with automatic weapons on a concert, a country music festival that was taking place on the Strip. Uh, and because there were so many people there and it was so exposed, the number of injured and dead is extremely high. The death toll, again, the highest in U.S. history. The president expected to uh, address the nation and make comments about this shooting sometime in the next few mo moments. And if we're not uh, busy with our ceremony here in this country, we will bring you part of what the president has to say. Let's go back now to Parliament Hill where uh, the prime minister, his wife, and the Senate's representative, Peter Harder, standing by and waiting for Judy Payette. Why do you think uh, the government chose Madame Payette? Well, uh, as we saw going through her CV, it's quite an incredible listing of accomplishments. Um, similarly, there is a tradition that you switch from Anglophone to Francophone, and therefore uh, David Johnson being an Anglophone, uh, now Judy mm -hmm. Payette. Um, Although she speaks six languages. Yes, so. indeed. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but she's a Quebecer, certainly, yes. Right. And I think with this government, as you noted, uh, the fourth woman, but uh, yep. maybe now getting into a new tradition of ensuring that we switch between men and women as well. Yep. Um, and similarly, I, I think it's, uh, there, there was some hope, perhaps, to have an Indigenous Governor General, but as with all issues that surround Crown, uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous relations, these things are trickier than, than they may seem at first blush. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. What, so not to go, you know, re, retread that, that, but that was a significant rumor based right. on some actual information. So would it have been just too complicated to have an Indigenous representative of the Crown? Well, I think in, in certain circumstances, uh, uh, I'm by no means an expert on this, but the, uh, the Indigenous scholars that I've read uh, noted that in some cases it would have been seen as inappropriate, yeah. that uh, somewhat tokenism at this point until reconciliation is okay. actually accomplished. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and it's, uh, you, you could even imagine it might be difficult for uh, somebody in that office, if you remember the uh, Idle No More movement, mm -hmm. insisting on meeting uh, David That's right. Johnson. Yeah. And would there be a sense that, again, until reconciliation is accomplished, would it be seen as uh, uh, too early uh, at this point? So I think that was, it yep. was probably looked into. Uh, but there are probably uh, a number of different reasons why ultimately that uh, that ambition wasn't realized at this stage. There was also um, some talk that the, the, Judy Payette was sort of on the prime minister's radar. He is sort of a science geek himself, frankly. He's interested in science and space. Um, and that she wasn't initially available, and then she became available for whatever reason. Um, and he sort of jumped on that opportunity to, um, to choose her as, and there she is, Judy Payette. And Warm welcome from the Prime Minister. Yeah, go ahead, Philip. Oh, well, my understanding is that uh, Sophie Trudeau also played a, a very important part in, in convincing her to take the position. Really? That's interesting. Uh, and there's Melanie Jolie as well, uh, just behind them. Uh, and I, this is my first uh, glimpse of Judy Payette's son, uh, Laurier Payette Flynn, who's 14 and about to uh, enter a world that maybe he hadn't imagined. There's a difference between, you know, having a mom who's a public figure and a mom who's the Queen's representative in Canada. It's Absolutely. sort of going to be everywhere. Uh, so that'll be an adjustment for him as well. And my understanding there is that uh, uh, Judy Payette has insisted that uh, his privacy be respected and that uh, he be treated uh, with a good deal of respect, and you can imagine how you want to grow up normally, and Canadian media are better about that than uh, many other countries of respecting people's private lives and their families. Yes, yeah. right. we, we, we are, uh, generally, but you, you do now allow me to point to the two sort of points of contention uh, when Madame Payette was, was named. Uh, the media were able to report that she had, uh, in July of 2011, uh, been uh, at the wheel of a car and accidentally killed a 55-year-old pedestrian. There were no, uh, it was a complete accident, but this did emerge as part of the public examination of, of Judy Payette. There was, an, an, again, an attempt to um, look at a second-degree assault charge in uh, 2011. The charge was withdrawn, it was expunged, but then there became an examination into uh, some divorce records between her and her ex-husband which in the end we you know were looked at and there was nothing really in the public interest so they were they were abandoned and that that probably is a credit to the Canadian media for not reporting on just what seemed to be a fairly regular 
uh, divorce. But they were the two sort of points that popped up and, and probably a good reminder to Madame Bayette about how, yes, Canadian media are respectful of your privacy, but this is a different kind of role where the level of scrutiny um, is probably a little more intense than even she had anticipated. Well, that's absolutely correct, and I think that's one thing that uh, the new Governor General is maybe not be used to. Uh, although it is a ceremonial function, it's still the second highest office uh, in the Canadian state, and therefore there will be interest in it. And we have seen past vice regal officers uh, get involved in yep. some levels of chicanery in some cases. So <laughs> it's it's not out, uh, out out of the question to to look into that. Yeah. Okay, I think we're going to head to uh, Whitby, Ontario. Whitby, Ontario is the place uh, where there is a, a, one of her accomplishments, of course, Julie Payette's accomplishments, is that she is one of only two Canadian women who has uh, gone to space, and she's inspired lots of people uh, in this country and around the world, and that's why there is one school named after Judy Payette in Whitby, Ontario. And um, with some help from the uh, Durham Regional School Board, uh, some students came up with some advice for Judy Payette, and I like to take advice from all places. So let's have a listen to see what the kids told her. Congratulations, Mademoiselle Payette. You speak many languages to represent all the people of Canada. We are proud of how you represented Canada in space. Good luck for all the Canada students at Julie Payette Public School. Bonjour, Madame Payette. Écoute bien. Nous avons les conseils pour vous. Have confidence in yourself. That's what my mommy tells me. N'oubliez pas de boire votre café le matin pour ne pas vous endormir. The Governor General should make wise decisions for Canada. Madame Payette, you inspire the students at our school to be the best that we can be. Tu nous as montré qu'on nous dépassait. Sur la terre comme dans l'espace, tu nous apprends à viser haut. Vous m'inspirez à travailler fort pour atteindre mon but de devenir un jour de baseball professionnel. You now have a new career as being Canada's new Governor General. To me, this shows it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. You can still make a big difference inside this world. Madame Payette, we want to share our vision of Canada for the future. My vision of Canada is that we will be an eco-leader country. Canada will be more conservative of our energy and gradually stop relying on resources that will harm nature. Nous aimerions que vous présentez le Canada comme une place où toutes les races, cultures et croyances sont acceptées. Let others know that Canada is a place where no one is afraid to be different. A, a land, land of diversity, diversity and where the land of First Nation rights are acknowledged. Canada is a place where children dare to dream, aspire and become. We are proud to call Canada home. We are proud of you. The 29th, 29th Governor, Governor General of Canada. Canada. Madame Payette, Gouverneur General du Canada, C'est avec plaisir, mais aussi avec beaucoup de fierté, que tous les membres de la communauté de l'école Julie Payette veulent vous féliciter pour votre nouveau poste et pour cette belle aventure qui commence pour vous. Vous continuez à nous inspirer à viser plus haut et à oser rêver. Toutes nos félicitations. So is at the Judy Payette Elementary School with some of those kids. We're going to bring you there. Uh, the Red Chamber is standing by. There's lots of people gathering there. But first, let's give these kids their 15 minutes of fame. Allie, what can you tell us about how excited they are for today? Oh, man, they are so excited. The, it, trying to choose anybody to speak with is impossible. They know so much about space and politics. It's a pretty smart bunch. Now, this school is pretty new. It opened up in 2011. It's a bilingual school, so that's very fitting to be named after a woman who speaks six languages. And, oh, yeah, of course, there is her storied career as an astronaut. And as I said, science is huge at this school. Just, I mean, take a look at the excite excitement. Can I get, like, a woohoo? Hello. So let's talk to some of the kids as promised. Liam, come on up. I want to ask, okay, what grade are you in? I'm in grade six. Okay, what was your favorite fact to learn about Julie Payette? Well, my favorite thing is that she can speak six different languages on top of being a mother, an astronaut, and now to be governor general. 
I sometimes stop to think, like, how does she do it all in such little time? Yeah, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a professional soccer player. Nice. All right. Okay, let's bring in some friends here. <laughs> Alex, I want to know what one of your favorite things is about Julie Payette. Well, one of my favorite things is that she was just watching TV one day, and that gave her a dream to become an astronaut, and she followed that dream and pushed through all the consequences and actually succeeded. So she saw it, she believed it, and became it. Yep. So that, is that now your motto as well? Yep. All right, good <laughs> luck. All right, I want to bring in Sharifa as well. What grade are you in? Seven. Awesome, okay. What is your favorite fact that you learned about Julie Payette? I love that she is a Francophone, so she speaks English and French, mm -hmm. and I love that she always stays focused on the things that, that matter, and she was a musician, an athlete, um, um, an engineer, and a scientist. Yeah, yeah, you, you can name anything. She probably was it. You want to be a dancer, right? Yeah. Cool, all right, good luck. And lastly, I want to bring in Isaac here. What grade are you in? I'm in grade eight. Awesome. What's your favorite thing about Julie Payette? I think my favorite thing is that she was the second Canadian in space, and that makes me very proud as a Canadian citizen. So I want to know, as an astronaut, what is that experience going to allow her to do now in this, you know, governmental role? I think it's definitely going to help her visualize the Earth and all the other countries without borders. Nice. And I think that's going to help her just in general throughout being a governor general. Cool, all right, good stuff, thanks Isaac. Okay, pop quiz. She is not going to be the only famous astronaut in Parliament. Can anybody name who that is? I wanna see a show of hands. Okay, bingo, all right, my man over here, what do you got? Who do you think it is? Mark Gennel, the Mark Minister of Transportation. Boom, I didn't even coach him. He knew his cabinet and everything. That's pretty impressive, right? That, so I, I'm impressed. First he could, I wanna show yeah. you guys, right? He could probably we take are my job. Yeah. These kids, <laughs> right? I mean, they also have a front row seat. CBC hooked them up with a live feed. They are watching you. They are going to be watching the ceremony uh, underway very soon with the rest of us across Canada. I'll send it back to you, Rosie. Okay, thanks for that, Alicia. So, and thanks to all the kids. I hope you enjoy the, the ceremony. We'll try and keep it entertaining. And Philip Lagasse will try and teach you a few things. <laughs> if you're listening, they don't care now. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that's fun. That's, it's nice to have the kids' perspective on someone who is very accomplished and, and goes to a school by their name. Just to give you a little uh, an update, uh, in fact, Madame Payette is so accomplished that she's actually going to uh, speak without notes today when we hear from her inside the Red Chamber. We're told uh, by the Governor General's office, by Rideau Hall, that she will speak to Canadians from the heart. Even I don't like to speak without notes, so uh, I look forward to hearing what that sounds like. I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, how she's approaching the day and some of the symbolic things that she has brought with her, and we'll bring you back inside the Red Chamber to see uh, cabinet members and other special invited guests uh, as the morning continues. But first, we want to bring you back to Toronto uh, and the CBC's John Northcott to give us an update on uh, those tragic developments in Las Vegas that happened overnight, still standing by to hear from the U.S. President at this hour, but John will give us the very latest for now. John. Thanks, Rosemary. A number of developments in that horrific attack in Las Vegas. More than 50 people are dead, and a staggering 406 people have been taken to hospital. That was the terrifying scene at the Harvest Music Festival when rounds of gunfire rained down from the 32nd floor of the hotel next door. It's now the worst mass shooting in modern U.S. history. Police say 64-year-old Stephen Paddock was the gunman. ISIS has claimed responsibility for the attack, saying the shooter converted to Islam months ago. Las Vegas police have not commented on that claim. This is the scene right now at the White House in Washington. U.S. President Donald Trump will be speaking about the Las Vegas shooting. We'll bring you his statement when it happens. This is a fast-moving story, but here's what else we know right now. The attacker, Stephen Paddock, was a resident of Mesquite, Nevada, about 125 kilometers northeast of Las Vegas. Until now, his only contact with police was for a traffic violation. He checked into the Mandalay Bay Hotel on September 28th. He was found dead in the hotel room there with as many as 10 firearms. It's believed he was the sole gunman. Meanwhile, at least 50 people are dead, including at least one Canadian. More than 400 have been taken to hospital. Authorities are still working to reunite families with those, those who were separated in the chaos. A number of Canadians were in that crowd when the shooting started. CBC News Network spoke to two people from Vancouver 
who were at the concert. There's, there's uh, it's, it's not a situation that you think you're you're ever going to be in. You don't think it's ever going to happen to you. You know, you, you see it in movies and on TV, and then it happens. And you know, all you can think about is uh, just the people around you, and you know, talking to your loved one again. You know, you know talking to your mom again, talking to your brother again. Um, that's that's really you know all that was running through my mind at that point, and along with uh, with keeping her safe. It doesn't even feel like that long ago. It was hours ago, but uh, honestly, it feels like it could have been ten minutes ago. And it's really difficult to hear those shots. It was about I'd say 20, 25 minutes into into his set. He was yeah. the last performer of uh, of the weekend. Uh, we were situated towards the back of the festival ground, so the main stage was in front of us. Uh, there was a mosh pit in front of that, probably, I'd say, 400, 500 yards from where we were on, uh, on these metal bleachers. And uh, we started hearing these pops in quick succession, seven or eight pops at a time, just kind of like... And to be honest with you, at, at first, everybody kind of got startled by it. We looked around and we were like, you know, probably fireworks or, you know, bottle rockets or something like that. Uh, so nobody really thought anything of it, um, and then five, six seconds later, uh, I've heard it again, and at this point, uh, um, we were still, I guess, looking up at the stage, but we saw the performer, uh, Jason Aldean, um, he basically just, he ran backwards off the stage, um, all the house lights came up from the stage, and then we just saw, like, this rush of people from, I guess, that were down on the floor, uh, running back towards us, where we were. And then at the same time on these bleachers, a uh, gentleman behind us, I think he might have been ex-military or something like that, said that's like those are gunshots or like there's gunshots or something. And uh, everybody just pretty much hit the deck right away. Two Canadians who were very lucky to escape unharmed when that mass shooting took place in Las Vegas. CBC News has learned that a Canadian has been killed. Parents of Jordan McDillon of Maple Ridge, Ontario, say he was a victim of the attack. Now back to Rosemary Barton in Ottawa. Rosemary? Okay. Thanks for that, uh, John. That's the CBC's John Northcott, obviously, with uh, so many people killed. Uh, we will continue to update things throughout the coming hours uh, out of Toronto and here in this studio as uh, things un unfold. Let's bring you into the Red Chamber. Can we do that? No? No, oh, maybe not. There we go. <laughs> That's the, the Red Chamber where uh, the ceremony is uh, just beginning for the installation of Canada's 29th Governor General, Judy Payette. Lots of dignitaries uh, there in the crowd. Seats, uh, seats are uh, hard to get inside that Red Chamber, but you can see in the middle uh, the federal cabinet seated around uh, and in and amongst them uh, various dignitaries that have been invited either by the government or uh, by the Governor General designate person. Himself, including members of the Supreme Court, uh, the Governor General, who he is, he is still the Governor General, David Johnston, and his wife, Sharon Johnston. Uh, there are other uh, former Governor Generals in attendance, including Adrian Clarkson and her husband, uh, representatives of Mikhail Jean, her husband and daughter, because she herself is, uh, is not in attendance. Former Prime Minister, I saw Jean Chrétien in the crowd there before, as well as a bunch of astronauts, too, because uh, Judy Payette's got that whole astronaut thing going for her. Um, what, if you had to guess about, because each, each Governor General sort of has to take up a cause. That's, they sort of decide on something they want to do and promote, and, and in the case of um, David Johnson, it seemed to be volunteerism, literacy, those kinds of things. I, I don't know if Judy Payette will just naturally take up knowledge, innovation, science. This is that this government places yeah. on science, and particular women in science, so I suspect that might be something that she emphasizes. On the cultural side, perhaps in music, given what we noted and her coat of arms, that would be another area where she uh, would excel. But uh, evidence, science. Roberta Bondar for people who are just watching. Keep going, yeah. These types of things. I suspect will be uh, uh, pretty front and center, uh, but she might surprise us. It's, uh, it's difficult to predict at this point. Yeah. A little bit of, an, uh, of note, this might be interesting to the viewers. Why are we in the Senate? Uh, because the Crown and the Crown's representative can't be in the House of Commons. So that's, that's a fun so, Philip uh, fact, yes. <laughs> so we can't know. Ever since Charles I uh, burst in and uh, attempted to arrest uh, uh, some members of the House of Commons, it's now uh, been uh, uh, a fairly significant convention that the uh, the Crown and the Crown's representatives do not enter the House of Commons. Just in case Just someone in case. tries to overthrow someone, yes. Uh, here's the official uh, party arriving.
Uh, and soon you will see the governor general designate as well. Uh, the Prime Minister, the Supreme Court Justice Beverly McLaughlin, Senate Representative, Speaker of the Senate, Speaker of the House of Commons, Melanie Joly. Please be seated. I should also just tell viewers as you watch uh, Madame Payette enter the Red Chamber that she is, we are told, wearing uh, the last spike brooch on her coat. The it's a diamond brooch new governor -general is made by the last, one of the last two spikes put in place uh, to complete the Pacific Railway. The and it's been previously uh, worn by uh, Jeanne Sauvé. And ceremonial structure. Adrian Clarkson and Mikael Jean. La gouverneur générale désignée, Madame Julie Payette, fera son entrée accompagnée du chef d'état-major de la défense, le général Jonathan Vance, du commissaire de la gendarmerie royale du Canada par intérim, le sous-commissaire Dan Dubo, et du secrétaire du gouverneur général, Monsieur Stephen Wallace. An engineer, scientific broadcaster and corporate director, Miss Julie Payette was an astronaut for two decades, flying two missions in space. Her experience and her passion for science, languages, sport, and music will serve her well in her new role as she continues to inspire Canadians and bring them together. Here to sing our royal anthem as the Governor General designate makes her official entry is Danielle Taylor, who is recognized as Canada's star countertenor and our country's most prolific recorded artist. Veuillez vous lever pour l'entrée officielle et demeurer debout pour notre hymne royal, Dieu protège la reine, qui sera interprété par Daniel Taylor. Please rise for the official entry and remain standing for the singing of God Save the Queen.
Veuillez vous asseoir. You may be seated. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Algonquin Nation on whose traditional and unceded territory we are gathered today. And I would like to invite Elder Claudette Commanda to officially open today's ceremony. For the last 30 years, Algonquin Elder Commanda has promoted First Nations people, history, and culture at the university level as a student, professor, and chair of the Aboriginal Education Council. She is currently the executive director of the First Nations Confederacy of Cultural Education Centers, a national organization that promotes and protects First Nations culture, languages, and traditional knowledge. L'aîné Algonquin Claudette Commanda sera accompagnée de Jonathan Pitseolak, un jeune Inuit qui fera une danse au tambour, d'Olivier Boulette, un violonneux métis, et des danseurs métis Prairie Fire. Madame Payette, Prime Minister Trudeau, Chief Justice, Honorable Ministers and Judges, Distinguished Guests, Pijaj Egoma, Anishinaabe Eki, Bevenu, à la Territoire des Algonquins, welcome to the territory of the Algonquin people. Madame Payette, as an Algonquin woman, a mother, a grandmother, and a citizen of this land, I am honored to welcome you. I am honored to be part of your momentous installation here today. In accordance with Anishinaabe law and responsibilities, we must give thanks to the Creator. We must ask for blessings for whom we acknowledge here today. I humble myself before the Creator and my ancestors, and I say, Miigwech gishiminado onje nongum. Ne buksendam minopamadzwin onje Julie Payette eshishkakina. Madame Payette, may your ancestors and the ancestors of this land guide you with good spirits. May they give you courage, strength, wisdom, protection, and good health. And peace unto you and your family, and to all you shall meet in your journey as Canada's Governor General. Merci, thank you, and many blessings to you, Madame Payette.
Depuis la Confédération, en 1867, la fonction de gouverneur général a constamment évolué et est devenue distinctement canadienne, reflétant ainsi la réalité de la Couronne au Canada. Les lettres patentes de 1947 ont redéfini les pouvoirs et multiples fonctions constitutionnelles remplies par le gouverneur général au nom de la souveraine. The latter's patent of 1947 describe in detail the governor general's powers and responsibilities. They also require that this description be read in public when a new governor general is sworn into office. J'invite M. Stephen Wallace, secrétaire du gouverneur général, à donner lecture du texte de cette commission royale signée par Sa Majesté la Reine Elisabeth II, Reine du Canada. Elisabeth II, par la grâce de Dieu, Reine du Royaume-Uni du Canada et de ses autres royaumes et territoires, chef du Commonwealth, défenseur de la foi, à notre fidèle et bien-aimé Julie Payette, salut. Par notre présente commission, sous notre grand sceau du Canada, nous vous nommons, vous, Julie Payette, notre gouverneur général et commandante en chef du Canada, à titre amovible, avec tous les pouvoirs, droits, privilèges et avantages appartenant ou attachés à la charge. Et par les présentes, nous vous conférons l'autorisation et le pouvoir, et nous vous enjoignons à vous, notre représentante, d'exercer les attributions et d'observer les instructions contenues dans des lettres patentes délivrées sous notre grand sou du Canada en date du huitième jour de septembre de l'an de grâce 1947, constituant la charge de gouverneur général et commandant en chef du Canada, ou dans toute autre lettre patente comportant adjonction, modification ou substitution à cet égard. Et, en outre, nous décidons par les présentes qu'aussitôt que vous aurez prêté les serments prescrits et assumé les fonctions de votre charge, notre présente commission prendra effet. Et par les présentes, nous enjoignons à tous et à chacun de nos fonctionnaires, ministres et faits sujet au Canada, ainsi qu'à tout autre intéressé, de prendre connaissance des présentes et d'y obéir en conséquence. Donnez sous notre saint royal et sous notre grand sou du Canada ce 20e jour de septembre de l'an de grâce 2017 66e de notre règne. Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom, Canada, and other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, to our trusty and well-beloved Julie Payette, greeting. We do, by this our present commission under our great seal of Canada, appoint you, Julie Payette, to be, during our pleasure, our Governor-General and Commander-in-Chief in and over Canada, with all the powers, rights, privileges, and advantages belonging or appertaining to the office. And we do hereby authorize, empower, and command you, as our representative, to exercise and perform all in singular the powers and directions contained in certain letters patent under our great seal of Canada, bearing date the 8th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1947, constituting the office of Governor General and Commander-in-Chief in and over Canada, or in other letters patent adding to, amending, or substituted for the same. And further, we do hereby appoint that so soon as you shall have taken the prescribed oaths and have entered upon the duties of your office, this our present commission shall come into effect. And we do hereby command all in singular, our officers, ministers, and loving subjects in Canada, and all others whom these presents may concern, to take due notice hereof and to give their ready obedience accordingly. Given under our royal hand and under our great seal of Canada, this 20th day of September, in the year, Lord, in the year of our Lord, 2017, and in the 66th year of our reign. The document just read, commissioning Miss Payette, is the cornerstone of today's ceremony, signaling the Queen's confidence and our collective pride in her appointment as Governor General and in her ability to carry out her duties. The Right Honorable Beverly McLaughlin will now administer the required oaths. La prestation des serments doit avoir lieu en présence des membres du Conseil privé de la Reine pour le Canada, composé des membres du gouvernement et d'éminents citoyens canadiens. M. Michael Vernick, greffier du Conseil privé, remettra maintenant à la juge en chef du Canada le texte des serments.
Je lirai maintenant les sermons. I will now read the oaths. Vous, Julie Payette, affirmez-vous solennellement que vous serez fidèle et porterez sincère allégeance à Sa Majesté la Reine Elisabeth II, Reine du Canada, à ses héritiers et successeurs. Do you solemnly affirm that you will well and truly serve Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in the office of Governor General and Commander in Chief of Canada and duly impartially administer justice therein? Je l'affirme solennellement. I do. Merci. Let's keep going. That's okay. Do you, Julie Payette, solemnly affirm that you will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors? I do. Uh, Affirmez-vous solennellement que vous servirez fidèlement et loyalement à Sa Majesté la Reine du Canada II en qualité de garde du Grand Sceau de Canada? Oui, je l'affirme solennellement. Affirmez-vous solennellement que vous servirez fidèlement et loyalement à Sa Majesté la Reine Elisabeth II en qualité de gouverneur général et commandante en chef du Canada et administrez-vous la justice de façon convenable et impartiale. Oui, je l'affirme solennellement. Do you solemnly affirm that you will well and truly serve Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in the office of Keeper of the Great Seal of Canada? I do. The Governor General va maintenant signer les registres des serments que le Premier ministre, la juge en chef et le greffier du Conseil privé contresigneront. The signed oaths will be kept in the Privy Council oath book as evidence that the new Governor General has duly taken the oath of allegiance and the oath of office on this day. Please rise, veuillez vous lever. Mesdames et messieurs, la Gouverneure générale du Canada, Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Julie Payette. Have it. Uh, Judy Payette is now Canada's 29th Governor General by signing those three oaths uh, and taking the oaths by the uh, Chief Justice of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin. I believe that's her mother there that you can see, uh, very emotional, her father and her sister also in attendance. A big moment in a life full of big moments for Judy Payette. A 21 gun salute outside of uh, Parliament. Lots and lots of happy faces inside the Red Chamber, the Senate, where this ceremony is being held. And in a few moments, we will hear directly from uh, the new Governor General, who's going to deliver her address to Canadians without notes to give us a sense of what she wants to uh, bring to the job and what she wants to represent for Canadians. You may be seated. Veuillez vous asseoir.
Today's proceedings will feature some artistic performances in addition to the required ceremonial elements. The songs and the artists were especially chosen by Her Excellency for this very special occasion. La première prestation artistique nous vient de deux étoiles montantes de la musique francophone au Canada. Elles ont toutes deux été révélées lors de la saison 2012 de Star Academy et ont depuis enregistré plusieurs albums solo. The friendship of our two performers has led them to a professional collaboration. This summer, they began performing together in their touring show entitled Je te donne. Mesdames et messieurs, veuillez accueillir Joanie Benoît et Melissa Bédard qui interpréteront une chanson du légendaire Leonard Cohen.
On behalf of Her Majesty the Queen, font of all honors, the Governor General presents honors and awards to recognize those people who have demonstrated excellence, courage, or exceptional dedication to service in ways that bring special credit to this country. The Canadian Honor System is administered by the Chancellery of Honors, which is part of the office of the Secretary to the Governor General. A newly installed Governor General becomes Chancellor of the Order of Canada, the Order of Military Merit, the Order of Merit of the Police Forces, and head of the Canadian Heraldic Authority. J'invite maintenant la sous-secrétaire du Gouverneur Général, Chancellerie des Distinctions Honorifiques et Vice-Chancelière d'Armes, Madame Emmanuelle Sajous, et la directrice et héros d'armes du Canada, Madame Claire Boudreau, à présenter à la Gouverneure Générale les colliers de fonction associés aux ordres nationaux et à l'autorité héraldique du Canada. Le collier de chancelière de l'Ordre du Canada. Le collier de chancelière de l'Ordre du Mérite militaire. Le collier de chancelière de l'Ordre du Mérite des corps policiers. Et finalement, le collier de chef de l'Autorité héraldique du Canada. C'est pour moi un honneur d'accepter les colliers de chancelier de l'Ordre du Canada, chancelier de l'Ordre du mérite militaire, chancelier de l'Ordre du mérite des corps policiers et chef de l'autorité héraldique du Canada. I am honored to accept the colors of the Chancellor of the Order of Canada, Chancellor of the Order of Military Merit, Chancellor of the Order of Merit of the Police Forces and the head of the Canadian Heraldic Authority. These honors constitute the centerpiece of the Canadian Honor System. The Great Seal of Canada is a symbol used on all state documents representing authority and authenticity. Used on proclamations and commissions, it provides the formal sanction of the Crown to all state documents. The current seal dates back to the beginning of the reign of Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada. J'invite maintenant le registraire général du Canada, l'honorable Navdi Baines, à présenter à la gouverneure générale le Grand Sceau du Canada. Le ministre est accompagné du sous-registraire général, M. John Nobley. Je confie à votre garde le Grand Sceau du Canada. I hand you the Great Seal of Canada for safekeeping. Because you're stumbling. Mesdames et Messieurs, écoutons maintenant une chanson composée par Félix Leclerc, un homme qui a eu une influence profonde sur la musique populaire au Québec et ailleurs dans le monde. Quartum, whose repertoire includes a wide range of classical and popular music, will perform Moi, mes souliers. Sur mes souliers fêlés, le monde est sa misère. Moi, mes souliers ont passé dans les prés. Moi, mes souliers ont piétiné la lune. Puis mes souliers ont couché chez les fées et fait danser plus d'une. Ils 
ont marché pour trouver des bouchers. S'ils ont traîné de village en village, suis pas rendu plus loin qu'à mon lever, mais devenu plus sage. Tous les souliers qui bougent dans les cités, souliers de gueux et souliers de vin, un jour cesseront d'user les planchers, peut-être cette semaine. Non, mes souliers doivent fouler la tête, moi mes souliers ont préféré les plaines, quand mes souliers iront dans les musées. Ce sera pour s'y si accrocher. Au paradis, paraît-il, mes amis, c'est pas la place pour les souliers vernis. Dépêchez-vous de salir vos souliers si vous voulez être pardonné. Si vous voulez. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister of Canada, le Premier ministre du Canada, le très honorable Justin Trudeau. Assembled right honorables, honorables, distinguished guests, dear friends, Vos Excellences, Your Excellences, Monsieur et Madame Johnston, Mr. and Mrs. Johnston, Laurier, Laurier Madame Payette, Ms. Payette. C'est pour moi un privilège d'être à vos côtés aujourd'hui. Au moment today, où vous vous apprêtez à devenir sa représentante, sa majesté la reine au Canada, majesty, the Queen of Canada, and our 29th Governor General. Bon nombre de Canadiens Many Canadians are already aware of the details incroyable. of your incredible journey, a, a journey that is a testament to not only to your talent, but also to the qualities that make you an exceptional Canadian. On May 27, 1999, it was the entire country that watched you leave Earth with pride and emotion. That first uh, voyage struck the imagination of children who, right across this country, watched you carefully fly towards the stars. Children who dreamed of getting into a rocket and living in weightlessness, a dream that once filled the mind of a young girl from Montreal who watched uh, Americans in spacesuits uh, drive a jeep uh, on the moon, on the television. But children were not the only ones to be impressed. In a way, it was an even greater moment for adults whose dreams tend to remove themselves as the years go by. That day, Canada learned to know about an accomplished scientist, an intrepid astronaut, and a passionate Canadian, a woman whose knowledge, determination, and curiosity led her not only to realize her own dreams, but also to feed those of an entire country and an entire generation. An educator, a musician, a polyglot, an athlete, a pilot, and a mom who, on multiple occasions, went where very few others had dared to go. A team player, a trailblazer, and a pioneer who proved to boys and girls, men and women across this great country, that the sky was, in fact, not the limit. <laughs> Upon her return, Ms. Payette dedicated much of her time to sharing her passion for science with Canadians and with the rest of the world. 
She most notably worked as a scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., and was appointed scientific authority for Quebec in the United States. Many Canadians will also remember her scientific outreach programs on Radio-Canada or her time spent at the helm of the Montreal Science Centre, where she used her expertise to educate and inspire. The list of her accomplishments goes on and have earned her numerous awards and distinctions, not only in Canada, but around the world. Your journey through space and through life may be unique, but the qualities that underpin each and every one of your successes are not. Your numerous achievements are above all a testament to your hard work, discipline, and most importantly, your passion. Whether as Canada's chief astronaut or as an Olympic flag bearer, you represent the very best of what it means to be Canadian and to serve Canada with aplomb and integrity. Aujourd'hui, Today, Madame as Payette Ms. Payet chooses to answer the call to serve Canada a second time, she becomes part of a long tradition of Canadians, exceptional Canadians, who have marked the history of this country. And if you don't mind, I would like to take a moment to directly address one of them, who will very soon be Ms. Payette's predecessor, His Excellency, the Right Honourable David Lloyd Johnston. Over the last seven years, His Excellency has fulfilled his duties with uh, humility and humanity. On behalf of all Canadians, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to their excellencies, Mr. and Mrs. Johnston, for their many contributions. You have made Canada a stronger and a better country. Thank you, dear friend. And while Ms. Payette stands on the shoulders of giants, I have no doubt that she will carry on one of Canada's oldest traditions by shaping this role into her own. As an agent of change and a powerful voice for progress, this two-time extraterrestrial Canadian <laughs> will bring a new perspective on Canada and on its place in the world. I look forward to working alongside Her Excellency as she continues to go boldly where few others have gone before. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Merci, Monsieur le Premier ministre. Thank you, Prime Minister. Now, please join me in welcoming members of Canada's award-winning period instrument orchestra, Tafel Music, performing Mozart's Divertimento in D major, K136 Allegro. <laughs>
Mesdames et Messieurs, Son Excellence, la Gouverneure Générale du Canada, Her Excellency, the Governor General of Canada. Prime Minister, Ms. Grégoire, Madam Chief Justice, members of the Vice Regal family, Mr. Speaker of the House of Commons, Monsieur le Speaker of the Senate, Indigenous people and leaders, Representants des Premières Nations, Representatives of the First Nations, Ni Danamikwak, Kakina, Ashinabuflik. Uwa ta tewach. Achich, kakina, megwach. Kadaji, ni du tamomach. Et je continue. Membres du corps diplomatique. Members of the diplomatic corps, parliamentarians, ministers. Premier ministre provinciaux, ex premier ministre en Provincial premiers. Former premiers, members of the public service, distinguished guests, dear friends, members of my family, colleagues, and friends who came from all over the world. Bonjour. Good morning. Je vous salue. I convey my greetings to all of you who are here, all of you who took the time to come and see this secular passing of the powers that goes back to New France, but uh, which is now entirely Canadian and represents uh, the very foundation of our democracy. My greetings uh, go out especially to all of those who are watching from the Johnny MacDonald room. I would have liked to, for you all to be here, but I thank you for attending. You honor me, all of you, through your presence. And for those of you who came from far, so generously, once again, to send me off on an extraordinary journey, you give me the courage to stand right here in front of you today. I bring warm greeting from our servant, Queen Elizabeth II, to all Canadians. Her Majesty welcomed my son Laurie and I in her estate in Scotland just two weeks ago. She gave me the responsibility to represent her here in Canada as Governor General. And I accepted the duty with humility. Although, and the Prime Minister mentioned it already, I know this was, go that this was going to be a tough act to follow. As I try to stumble my way in the footstep of my predecessors and the footstep of a great man and a great woman, Governor General David Johnson, Madame Sharon Johnson, merci de m'accueillir dans votre famille. Merci. Thank you for welcoming me, me into your family. De ce passé opérationnel. Of uh, that unorthodox operational past, which I share with many people in this room right now. I did not expect uh, this appointment to Governor General. There's only one answer. Je suis tellement privilégié. I'm so privileged. I'm so honored to have the opportunity to represent you and to speak on behalf of this magnificent country. Prime Minister, I'd like to thank you for your recommendation and also thank you for your confidence in me. And if you don't mind, I'd also like to thank a very proud young man, my son Laurier, who was one of my first advisors and one of the first persons I consulted and who gave me permission to accept the job.
He gave me permission, if you, in case you didn't understand, he allowed me to accept the job. I would have liked uh, this room to be bigger in order to bring everyone in so we could all be together. Because you, uh, there are really a great many of you here. However, there's many eminent scientists in this room and lots of great high flyers, and they would tell you that we are inextricably bound by the same space-time continuum. And sorry, but we're all aboard the same planetary spaceship, <laughs> somehow. But together, the adage says, we can mount, move mountains, can we? With the brains and our smarts and our altruistic capability, we can indeed do a lot of good. And it's our duty to some extent, to help improve the lives of people in our community, to diminish the gap and the inequities here and elsewhere. And maybe, maybe if we try hard to work together, then we may have a chance to find the answers and we may be able to tackle global issues, serious and pressing global issues like climate change and migration nuclear proliferation, poverty, population growth, and so on, and so on. Because global issues, no, no borders, no timeline, and they do need truly our attention. I'm an, op je suis une optimiste. I'm an optimist. Totally, but also a pragmatist. And in fact, you can see that with the success of the International Space Station, it's clear that you can always do better together, better together than separately. And uh, we're more than the sum of our parts. Now, there are people in this room who were on the International Space Station and who uh, flew around the, the, the Earth and who have uh, been on the space station since it was created in 2000. We work together, cosmonauts, astronauts, people from different countries who on Earth may not see things the same way. We rarely see the International Space Station in the front of the newspaper because nothing really terrible happens up there. It works. People working together from different nations for a common good. They not only work together, they put effort together and they compromise where it is needed. Somehow, the International Space Station, but also big science, brings us, force us, to think not in the microcosm of nationality only, but to think in terms of what we could do to advance matters and to push the boundary of science as partners in a collective spirit and in, with a peaceful intent. I know that may sound a little unusual for human beings to adopt such behavior when it comes to opening uncharted territories, but hey, that's a promising development, isn't it? Lessons we could bring back to Earth a bit more often and apply them to specific cases. Of course, it's easier to say than it is to do. But I believe that here we're in a position, here in Canada, where more than ever, we can make a difference because we are rich, rich in values, in openness, in tolerance, uh, self-help, compassion, and because we decided as a people to share our wealth uh, as much as possible because we believe in equality of opportunity for all. And I am a product of this country. I truly believe that the, those very fundamental values unite us all. D'ailleurs, And in fact, my ancestor, Pierre Payet, Pierre Payet Saint -Amour, est sur ce came to this uh, territory in uh, 
1665. He was a soldier in the Carignan Regiment near Montreal. And this gives me an opportunity to salute and express my admiration and thanks to all the men and women who choose uh, to serve us in uniform. My ancestor was a military man, but when he was finished that career, he became a farmer, and he decided to set up in pointe aux trembles in Montreal. He had a lot of children. Several generations later, uh, uh, there I was with my father and my mother on the island of Montreal and my sister, and here we have another generation. Several years later, Another ancestor, François Payette, by name, became a coureur des bois. I imagine that he was good with a paddle, but he was especially someone who was uh, uh, confident to the Hudson's Bay Company. And François Payette left to explore the West uh, on the North American continent. And uh, now in Idaho, we, there is a, a city, a town, and a river that uh, uh, bear the name Payette. So I'm proud of my origins, but I realized a long time ago that all of our ancestors, mine as well, had been guided and supported by an extraordinary people, the First Nations, who with their generosity and their courage through the mountains, through the forests, and through the streams, opened up the way, opened the way to the rest of us. They were the first pioneers on this land, and they still are. They taught us to fight the cold and survive in it, how to appreciate the gifts of nature. And they taught us about community. It is a good thing that we finally decided to listen again to their wisdom. La réconciliation. Reconciliation. Qui dit? Nino. Oui, dit d'un animal. I'm going to please bear with me on this one. Qui dit? Megwene. Magoniwas. Missiwe Anisnafe. Achish Nigan. Abinu. Chija. K. Pimaziziwa. La réconciliation doit s'accomplir. Reconciliation must happen for the welfare of our communities and for the future of our children. And talking about children, we talked about some of the things that interested me when I was a child. But I understand and I know just how lucky I was to be born in this country and to be born in that family. Because my parents, uh, gave me an education, the education I had as I grew up, and the opportunities that uh, made all the difference. When I was uh, a young girl, I wanted to be an astronaut because I watched uh, astronauts uh, go to the moon with the Apollo mission. I watched it on television. And yet, I did not even speak the language they spoke. But it wasn't important. I wanted to do the same thing they did. The important thing is that no one discouraged me along the way. And later, the Olympics came up. They came to my city in 1976, and then I discovered a cosmopolitan city with the excitement of wonderful performances and the pride of a country. I wanted to do like them. I wanted to be an Olympian. I wanted to travel, but I didn't have the talent. However, I was never, ever discouraged it's from trying. The Prime Minister said that. It's almost as if we talked. <laughs> we didn't. When you're eight years old and you find something interesting and you want to do it again, you dream about it 
And then somehow, as we grow older, we forget about this, that we are perhaps able to do things that other people tell us you, we cannot do. This <coughs> dare to dream is within us. Fast forward, quelques années plus tard, a few years later, when I was 16, I was able to get a grant to go and study in an international college in Great Britain. And thank heavens, I was encouraged to go, and I left with uh, my faulty English and my two suitcases, but full of convictions, and yet with uh, so little certainty. At 16, when I ended up in a college overseas, I left Canada without a single worry in my heart because I had been given the greatest gift of all, unconditional love. Because when I left, I knew somehow that no matter what happened, even if I failed, they would take me back. My parents would be there for me, and they still are today. My mère Jacqueline, mon père André. My parents. They gave me wings, and I took full advantage of them afterwards. I can assure you of that. But uh, when I came back uh, from that trip, I came back with uh, profound convictions, simple but profound, education, accessible to all, is the key to any successful society, that diversity is a source of wealth, an asset that sport can take us very far, that uh, we stand together stronger, and there is no magical solution in life except uh, hard work and moving forward. Somehow, <coughs> it's been a, a, an amazing journey for, uh, for us now, but I'm a true believer in the strength of teamwork, in the power of dreams, and on the absolute necessity of a support structure. And this is exactly the backbone of this country. This is our fabric. I am convinced that anyone can accomplish anything and raise to the challenge as long as they are willing to work with others, to let go of the personal agenda, to reach a higher goal, and to do what is right for the common good. And this is exactly what I hope that my mandate as a Governor General will reflect. One of the greatest privileges uh, that we receive, we who have had an opportunity to see the earth from far above it, is uh, to be able planet. to observe this planet, that we all share the 7.5 billion uh, people, humans, on this planet. We are all of the same race, and we share this extraordinary world, this extraordinary world that uh, uh, looks uh, so small in space, with no borders. That's a, an invention of man with the atmosphere around it. This planet must be passed on to future generations in good shape. And that should affect every single one of our decisions and choices in life. But seeing the number of young people here in this room, I think, I think things will go fine. have a lot of work to do. I think the path is for us to just take, trust science, believe that innovation and discoveries are good for us, and make decisions based on data and evidence. We are the true north, strong and free, and we should continue all the time to look out for those who have less, to stand for those who can't, to reach out across differences, to use our land intelligently, 
to open our borders and welcome those who seek harbor and never, ever cease to be curious, ask questions, and to explore and search. Oh, and by the way, we shouldn't forget to, to uh, be happy about celebrating who we are and what we'd like to become. And the young people in this room show us here, right here in the Senate of Canada, the highest uh, authority in this country. All these young people show us that Canada is in good hands. Friends, please aim high. Dare to dream. And Prime Minister stole my best line. It's true. Don't be afraid, because the sky has now we know. À la vie qui nous unit. Merci. And that is the first public address by Canada's 29th Governor General, Judy Payette. Delivered without notes, in multiple languages, calling on Canada to dare to dream to work together as a team and to have the sky uh, show no limits. There is no limits for this country. And she, uh, it was an inspirational speech that she delivered today to that room and to all Canadians. Again, doing it without notes, speaking from the heart about what she wants to change and help improve in this country, calling on Canadians to help her do that. And on a day with an enormous amount of tragedy, following a terrorist attack in Edmonton over the weekend where five people were injured, and a mass shooting in Las Vegas with now 53 Merci people dead, excellent. perhaps the kind of speech we needed to hear. Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, our ceremony is now drawing to a close. In just a few moments, Her Excellency and the official party will depart the chamber. We kindly ask that you remain at your place until the end of the programming in the Senate foyer and the departure of the other dignitaries before you proceed to the reception to follow in the Hall of Honor. In a moment, our national anthem will be sung by an artist who is a Canadian treasure. She has recorded 60 albums in French and English, performed in half a dozen films and several miniseries. Elle a reçu de nombreux prix et distinctions, dont une nomination à titre d'officier de l'Ordre du Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the singing of O Canada. Mesdames et messieurs, veuillez vous lever alors que notre hymne national est interprété par l'incomparable Ginette Renault. This is a surprise. <laughs> the incomparable Jeanette Renault, a famous Quebec singer, delivering the uh, singing the national anthem. That was not on the program and uh, was probably quite thrilling for many Quebecers and uh, music 
fans inside the Red Chamber there today. Uh, after this, they will uh, leave the Red Chamber and go back for uh, some signing of official documents before they head back outside, uh, where the new Governor General, Julie Payette, will examine um, do, uh, the Guard of Honor. Uh, she will also lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier a little bit later today. There she leaves now with her, uh, her son, 14-year-old uh, Laurier Flynn, Payette Flynn, rather who she said was uh, her first advisor and who first gave her permission to take what is a very public and important role in this country. My guest, uh, Philippe Lagacé, uh, from the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton is with me. He knows all things Westminster, but you, you also are just, a, you also were listening with interest to that speech. What, what, uh, what stood out for you as things that we should take away as, as maybe how this Governor General is going to go about her job? Well, she certainly gave us an indication of what she sees as her agenda, which is working with others, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. letting go of your personal agenda, and really a collective understanding of how to achieve things. Uh, she uh, also noted that you, you can achieve your dreams provided that you have a significant support system. So I think that was a, a pretty clear indication of where she sees her priorities of allowing people to achieve their full potential. Similarly, she did make allusion to the importance of data and evidence in, mm -hmm. uh, in policy making and to the global challenges that we need to uh, confront, notably climate change. Uh, nuclear proliferation, mm -hmm. migration, borderless issues. So things that uh, that come across from her time, as she was saying, also on the International Space Station, her ability to work with uh, representatives from other nations, astronauts from other nations, and achieve uh, common goals. So that uh, I think that's that's really what I took away from it as, as how she uh, wants to, the causes that she wants to promote. I'm just going to dip into this, uh, another little, I don't think I knew how this was happening, a little surprise ceremony just outside the Senate, in the Senate foyer there. We'll just listen in a little bit more and I'll bring uh, Phil Legacy in in a moment. Solidarité à la grande humanité. Ta cochino, ta cochino. One last performance on her way out of uh, the Senate there for the new Governor General, Julie Payette, uh, and her son, and the Prime Minister, and everyone you see there. Um, pretty remarkable, I thought, uh, Phil Legacy, as someone who does a lot of ad-libbing, that she was able to give that level of a speech, eloquent, uh, composed, as I said, in multiple languages, without notes. I mean, that just shows you sort of the kind of person that she is. Uh, certainly true, and uh, I suspect we'll see many more command performances from her over the course of her tenure. Uh, and that uh, gentleman just performing um, was uh, Florent Volant. Uh, he he's the guitarist. And I was just I was just emailing with some people at Rideau Hall. It was uh, apparently Julie Payette's request to have Ginette Renault perform the anthem but she asked uh, for everyone to keep it a secret, <laughs> to surprise everybody, which it obviously did. And for people who don't know Jeanette Renault, she is a, a, a big star in Quebec, so that would uh, blow some people away for sure. Um, and it was a pretty nice moment for uh, the Governor General as well. So you're seeing all the dignitaries leave the Senate Red Chamber right now. Um, and as we said, they, um, the new Governor General will go off uh, and she will sign a number of proclamations uh, in the, the Senate Speaker's office. Um, and she'll also sign the Government of Canada Golden Book. So we have a sense of the kinds of things that are probably going to shape her, her mandate, science, exploration, knowledge. Um, 
But I, I guess, and I guess this shouldn't surprise me as an astronaut, this whole call of sort of strength in numbers, mm -hmm. being united, being a team, um, I'm interested to see how she makes that into a practical mandate, I guess. Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames and messieurs, certainly going to be a thematic we now one, invite but, uh, the former I agree. governors general and their spouses, as well as the former prime ministers, to uh, proceed to the Hall of Honor for the reception. So there's lots of people that are going to, to leave that red chamber. You saw uh, the Premier of Newfoundland, the Premier of Ontario, former Governors General. There's uh, Jean Chrétien, of course, the former Prime Minister. Uh, he's also there. John Ralston Saul, uh, other other dignitaries and well-known Canadians. The LG of Ontario is there. Elizabeth Dowd as well. Good spotting. See, I wouldn't have got that one. That's why you're here to help me. <laughs> I believe that's the LG of Saskatchewan. Do you know all the LGs by heart? <laughs> do you do, like, is there like trivia at your house? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to see the others, but they're unfortunately, uh, we're seeing them from the back. Yeah, um, she also, Madame Payette also said it was unfortunate because the, the, the red chamber for people that haven't been in there is very, it's very small. Uh, it's, seating is small and limited, but it's, it's just very tiny. So many of her guests, of a, which she had a, a, apparently 400 or so, uh, were at another building LG across the street. Um, on Wellington. There's the LG of Quebec. Who, See, this is amazing. How probably, do you know this? Probably the LG that gets the, <laughs> the shortest shrift in the country. Unfortunately, usually they hide him in the closet. So he's, uh... <laughs> Another LG. Let me, uh, we, we're going to give you a full briefing in a moment of uh, the latest news in Las Vegas, but maybe I'll just, uh, maybe you guys can just throw me back up on camera for a moment while I uh, brief uh, viewers on what the situation is there. Of course, the ongoing and developing story out of Las Vegas, uh, a mass shooting overnight, the largest in U.S. history. Um, the president has now spoken. He spoke just before 11 o'clock Eastern. Um, he said it was, quote, an act of pure evil. He said uh, that he calls upon our bonds of faith and shared values. Uh, the president also went on to say, our unity cannot be shattered by evil, our bonds broken by violence. Um, the Las Vegas police also gave an update within the past half hour or so, confirming now that some 53 people are dead, more than 500 wounded, uh, many seriously injured still. So police were reluctant to commit to uh, concrete numbers because they do expect 58 people, sorry, 58 people killed. They do expect that number uh, to rise. Uh, as the as the day goes on, uh, the family of the shooter, Stephen Paddock, a 65-year-old man from Mesquite, Nevada, who took his own life before police broke down uh, the door uh, at the hotel where he had set up uh, this shooting range, for lack of a better word, to kill people at an open uh, country festival that was happening on the last Las Vegas Strip. Uh, his family says that they have no idea why he would have committed the shooting. Um, that he was just a guy who went to hotels and gambled. So obviously lots still to uncover in that investigation as to the motive behind why this happened. Um, but uh, it is the largest mass shooting in U.S. history. The president has, has spoken, 58 people dead, more than 500 injured, and we'll continue to track that story throughout this special day here in Canada, but also uh, across the news network as the day unfolds. I should also tell you that um, the, the terrorist attack that happened over the course of the weekend in Edmonton, where five people were injured, no one killed, remarkably. Uh, the police officer who was injured in that attack uh, now recovering. Charges have now been laid against uh, the man responsible, and we'll bring you more on that too, because I know people um, very attent attentive to what has happened um, in Alberta over the course of the weekend. This is in the side, the Senate foyer here back in Ottawa, where you can see the new Governor General, Julie Payette, uh, signing the official documents, the official proclamation that make her now uh, Governor General, and uh, the guest book. Um, and I believe we can go to the Senate foyer, where my colleague Hannah Thibodeau has managed to. Uh, get a, a, a good talker over to uh, stand with her and have a chat, Hannah. Thanks, Rosie. Yes, I have lured Mr. Jean Chrétien to come speak with us about the new Governor General, Julie Payette. So what did you think of her speech in there? But it's very unusual. She stood there with no notes and she spoke about, even spoke in uh, the language of the natives. And uh, no, it was very unusual and very interesting and very successful. What do you think of the choice of Ms. Payette for Governor General? I think it's a very good one. 
What makes her stand out? I mean, there's uh, yeah, a million you know, things, right? Yeah, there's so much, and you have a good example today. You know, she's a, a very unusual personality. She is a scientist. Uh, she speaks six. I learned this morning she even speaks seven languages, and she's been around the globe. She's been in orbit and came back, and I know her since some years, and, and I think that she has all the quality to be a very good example to the people of Canada, especially the young people. What do you think going ahead for Ms. Payette should be, we heard from her say, it's going to be science, it's going to be things like the environment, those types of issues. But, you know, she will uh, promote her convictions and what she thinks is good for Canada. Of course, she's not the government. The government decides. She is a great spokesman. And when she will be traveling, representing Canada around the globe, you know, the people will see a very good representative of Canada because of all the things she's done and all the abilities and the qualities that she can show. Now, you have chosen two governors general yeah. in the past. Yeah. Um, in choosing one, how difficult is it to make that decision? But you consult some people and eventually there is a moment when you decide who you take. And, uh, you know, I named the first Acadian, uh, Mr. LeBlanc, and after that, uh, uh, refugee. Madame uh, uh, Clarkson. Clarkson, you know, she was a refugee from the war from Hong Kong and she was a great governor general. And, uh, you know, and I think that the prime minister made a, a very good cho cho choice. They asked for my, if I agreed, of course. Uh, he did ask for your advice. Somebody asked me, yes. And Somebody I, asked. Yes, yeah, they did that. Mr. Harper had done the same thing with Mr. Johnson too. They had asked me for names and they have asked me for names. And, and now, I, I can't let you go without asking you what piece of advice would you give for the new Governor General? Be yourself. Just do it the way she wants to do it. You know, you can't. If you try to change yourself, you lose it. At one time, they tried to make me a little, a little bit different, and it was a disaster. When I was the leader of the opposition, they got me to read texts and, and look uh, what I was not. And eventually, I kicked them out, and I came back as the old Jean Chrétien, and that worked. And that worked and for she you. Will, she has to be herself all the way, and she will be a very great success, I know, because I, I know her very well, and uh, she's a friend of my wife and of my daughter and so on, and uh, we know her since years. Did you talk to her before, after, any time in the, like, last no, Since she has been appointed, no, I've not talked with her. But are you going to chat with her and... Probably, if she invite me. I guess she might. <laughs> She might have you yeah, for dinner. I'm not sure, but I would not be surprised. You'd be a good guest to have for dinner. Yes, and if she wants, we can invite all her home, too, <laughs> to be out of the protocol and have fun. All right. Thank Former you. Prime Minister Jean Bye -bye. Chrétien, thank you for your thank time. You. And he's out of here. He's just out of here like that, Rosie. But lots of good, interesting background from a prime minister who made the choice of governor general in the past himself. Yeah, some things never change. You can always no. count on Jean Chrétien to just say whatever he's thinking. <laughs> and he might have her over for dinner because, you know, that's Perfect. where you can have fun, he said, <laughs> over at his house. <laughs> I'm uh, hoping for an invite myself. All right, thank you, Hannah. I appreciate that. Them. Okay, if you get other guests, you let us know. Okay. Uh, that's the CBC's Hannah Thibodeau in the foyer of the Senate. We are uh, just now waiting for uh, Her Excellency, I guess I can call her now, to uh, exit uh, the Parliament buildings to do her first official, um, what am I calling it? She's looking at the Guard of Honor. She's mm -hmm. inspecting. Inspection. Inspection. Thank you. Yeah. Inspection of the Guard of Honor. Um, and there'll be a, a royal salute played as well. Okay, I want to. Sometimes I get emails while I'm on air and I do actually read them. And here's a good one I got from Albert Versteeg, uh, who writes me this. And you'll see why it's relevant in a minute. He writes As a matter of interest, the commander of the Honor Guard is my daughter, who epitomizes what our present government is looking for a lieutenant commander in the Navy, chemical engineering graduate, marine systems engineer aboard ship and the Canadian-born daughter of Dutch immigrants. That's pretty good. And she's got a pretty proud dad who wanted to make sure that uh, she got mentioned today as well um, on TV and noted for her excellency. So I, I encourage emails like that when they're, <laughs> when they're relevant. Um, so, um, it's, it, so now David Johnston just goes off back into private life and existence and has to sort of contend with, with whatever that looks like. Um, 
And I think he'll be happy to do that, to actually go into semi-retirement as much as uh, accomplished people like that can retire. And, and from now on, Julie Payette just starts taking up the mantle of all the ceremonial. What are, what are some of the first things that she would have to do other than this? What would be the first things sort of on her agenda? I guess Remembrance Day would be one. That's coming up. Uh, and there will always be orders and council to sign, sure. documents to sign, uh, getting a sense of the job, getting a sense of meeting with ad advisors that will uh, fill out her understanding of yeah. her, her role, her constitutional functions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably getting an idea as well of uh, what lays ahead in the coming months. These are trips that might be planned, yeah. other ceremonies. Yeah. Uh, everybody is going to be uh, trying to get a piece of her time. <laughs> And this is one of the, uh, the difficulties of being Governor General. I think there's a, a sense, certainly, of the wider social community, so civil society, that you're there and you're, you're present and you can be there, but the demands on, on a Governor General's time are going to be quite, Intense. Uh, quite significant. Well, someone who might be able to speak to that is with Hannah Thibodeau back in the Senate uh, foyer right now. Hannah. Thanks, Rosie. I'm joined by former Governor General Adrian Clarkson. Thank you for your time today. First off, uh, what do you think of the choice? I think it's a wonderful choice. The moment it was made, I thought, this is right. This woman knows science. Uh, she's an engineer. She's a woman. She brings something very different to this role. And I think that's, uh, that's a good thing. It couldn't help but be a good thing. And she's a, a warm, wonderful human being. You could see that with her son, uh, who looks so like her. And, uh, and that will bring something different to, to, uh, to the office and to the way she exercises it. I was deeply impressed with her speech. Um, I think she really wants to speak to the hearts of people. And she also wants to do the things that I think most Canadians feel are the right things to do. I think she's on the side of the common good. And um, her, ex her expressions of, of wanting to uh, help with that terrible gap of income in inequalities, with reconciliation with Native peoples. She spoke in Algonquin yes. uh, to people, and uh, I think was very impressive that way. I think she's uh, a brilliant, brilliant woman and a brilliant choice. What's the toughest job about being a Governor General? I think it's physically so demanding <laughs> that I'm glad she's only, what, 53? Um, it's physically very demanding because you do travel an enormous, enormous amount. And, and doing that traveling and being up for things, when you go on trips and you have five or six days in Alberta, I mean, every day you do six, seven, eight, nine, ten events, and you go from thing to thing, and speech to speech, and and uh, award to award and going among people and talking with them and trying to absorb what they're saying to you and that's what she's going to be doing and that's what I did a lot and I know she will do it which is to hear what they have to say and then bring it back to people who are in politics and say look you know this thing about fishing isn't working and we've heard it or this is not you know this is not the kind of thing that we should be standing for etc and the governor general doesn't have any power but has authority you know, and authority is very important, I, and I'm sure she's going to do it. I certainly would give her the advice to talk to the ministers and to the deputy ministers as often as possible because you find out things, and you can help by saying what you can bring back from the people of Canada. It's terribly important, that feedback. And I think she started out by saying, you know, I am here to talk to you and to be among you, and I think that is exactly the right stance. She hasn't put her foot wrong. Now, Ms. Clarkson, uh, you were telling me ahead of time you had a little something you wanted to say to Rosie Barton. Well, Rosie, you sure look pretty in pink. Oh. <laughs> she told me to. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> I watch you all the time. I like that pink. <laughs> I'll take it, Hannah. Say thank you very much. She said thank you very much. <laughs> You're very kind. <laughs> thank you for your time, Ms. Clarkson. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Rosie. Thank you. I rarely, you I rarely get compliments on television. So, well, you know, there you go. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you, Hannah. I appreciate it. Uh, this is CBC's Hannah Thibodeau with former Governor General Adrian Clarkson, along with compliments. She, she also said a few things there, uh, Phil Lagasse, that I, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that I really knew. Um, it, so a Governor General can speak to Cabinet and even Deputy Ministers to try and get information? Would that be, 
I mean, ministers maybe, but deputy ministers is a little surprising to me. Uh, I don't think most of us are aware of precisely what uh, the, the degree of access that uh, Vice Regals have in, uh, in Ontario currently. Uh, the, the LG meets regularly with deputies and, really? and with ministers. Uh, and I think this uh, Adrian Clarkson there just gave us a little glimpse into behind that curtain of Rita Hall in the sense that you do have access to ministers and occasionally to deputy ministers to try and, and exercise those powers of the Crown that, that are informal, the encouraging, the warning, the advising of the government so that it's it's not a one-way street, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the AGG can go out in communities, can hear things, and then uh, attempt to bring them back to ministers, to the government of the day, in that, in that role of somebody who travels the country uh, with an agenda of simply absorbing it yeah, all. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's going to be one piece of, of advice amongst many, but it's it's important to have that authority, as uh, Madame Clarkson said, to, you don't necessarily have the power, but you do have the authority, that formal authority of the Crown. So, so you have, so what, what would that look like then in a practical way? Yes, you're listening, you're taking information back, you're feeding it into the government if you think it's relevant. But are you then trying to influence? Well, or is I, that a step too far? It, that would be a step too far. As you'll remember, maybe over in the UK a couple of years ago, the Black Spider memos of Prince Charles mm -hmm. came out uh, through a, yes. a protracted access to information campaign. And what was revealed in those memos was that uh, the prince has a number of opinions about things, and he is not necessarily lobbying as, as he was charged, but he wants to make his views known, and he wants his concerns at least to be taken into account. And I suspect that's what we're dealing with uh, with the vice regals as well. They're not going to actively lobby uh, for particular causes or for particular policies, and they're not going to threaten anything no. uh, in terms of withholding uh, a signature or whatnot, but yeah. it's simply an opportunity for them to echo concerns that they hear in the community and to ensure that governments are, are aware of it. Uh, one particular uh, area uh, that, that is of concern is the governor general is also commander in chief of the armed forces, yes. yeah. and uh, uh, past governors general have had very intimate relationships with uh, the chief of the defense staff, Tom Lawson in particular, had a very close relationship with uh, David Johnson. And there you can also have the governor general uh, in, in his or her capacity as commander in chief have access to concerns about how the forces are doing, uh, the morale hmm. of the, the military, hmm. uh, and expressing that to the government of the day. So w what would be, for lack of a better word, what would be the clearance? I mean, how much secret or confidential information could you have access to? Anything you want? Well, technically, this again, this is the second highest office of the state. Yeah. Uh, there's always information that is need to know, but uh, a lot of those orders in council will pertain to matters uh, of national security yeah. or other matters. Yeah. And uh, this is still a member of the, the Privy Council as well, uh, therefore somebody who has, ha should have access to uh, the highest uh, level of information. So all the more reason to choose someone who maybe falls in line with your thinking a little bit, as, as definitely seems to be the case with Madame Payette and uh, Her Excellency Payette and, and the government in terms of science and data and that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, I think they, they expect her to, uh, to go out and reach out to those communities and yeah. to be a conduit to that community. And look, this is why I said earlier that th these appointments are nonpartisan, but they're never apolitical. Yeah. So there's definitely uh, an aspect of the importance of science for this government or, uh, and its centrality in policymaking is, is something that she is meant to personify and exemplify. And the fact that she has those, those connections and that outreach is something that I expect this government will, uh, will seize upon. And uh, we, we are expecting her to come out here, obviously, and uh, inspect uh, the ceremonial guard, after which she's also expected to go down to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and lay a wreath, because that is also another uh, important part of uh, being Governor General, those kinds of events. And we will see her at her first Remembrance Day in about a month or so from now. Uh, there's, I, I guess these are just regular people here gathered <laughs> along the side to, uh, on Parliament Hill. It's a lovely day here in Ottawa to, uh, to greet her and cheer her on as she, uh, as she departs from Parliament Hill. I don't know if the Lando will be brought out or if she'll just be leaving in, in the, uh, the limo, probably just the limo. Um, but uh, Judy Payette uh, now Canada's 29th Governor General and she also uh, has her son. And that's another thing that's interesting because uh, 
a lot of times this job, which you heard Adrienne Clarkson talk about there, is so demanding. Uh, Judy Payette is, is only 53, so she's not very old, but she doesn't have a partner, a spouse. Um, and the only reason I remark upon that is sometimes you can divide up the work between the, between the two of you. Certainly that's been the case for uh, the others that we've seen, and it, it becomes helpful to try and break up the work in terms of the country and the demands, and, and she's going to have to do this uh, by herself. Yeah, and at the, same, lot. At the same time, it's, it's interesting. Um, it may actually lead her to have a, a more progressive, family-friendly approach to the office. She may insist, for instance, that she gets time, yeah. uh, either in Montreal here or in Ottawa, to spend yeah. time with her son. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of one cabinet minister, Catherine McKenna, that makes it a point to see her children on a daily basis, and therefore the, what we're used to mm -hmm. and the reality of how you should be uh, can evolve. For sure, for sure. Uh, there's Judy Payette, she's exited. Maybe we'll just listen in here if we have any audio. <laughs> It's a little hard to hear, so you know what I'm going to do? Right in that same location, Hannah Thibodeau is there with a couple of astronauts. And I love, who doesn't love astronauts? Hannah, yeah, over to you. Absolutely, Rosie. How often do you get to speak with two astronauts? I'm joined by David St. Jacques and Jeremy Hansen, who, I'm going to come to you, David. First off, explain, you know, what Ms. Payette is to you. So I remember when I was a uh, university student, kind of maybe thinking of applying to be an astronaut one day, maybe. That's when Julie was uh, selected. I was too young to apply, and I followed that as, I look, who do they pick? I look at people's CVs, and she was very inspiring to me. She was a French Canadian, like I, a scientist, someone who loved sports, music, and I thought, yeah, you know, so long as you work hard enough and dream hard enough, maybe it's possible. And so right off the bat, she became an inspiration for me. And then years went by, and, and uh, one day I got the chance to be selected with Jeremy about eight years ago. And when we moved to Houston, uh, Julie was there. She was in training for a second space flight. And, uh, you know, she became kind of a kind of a big sister figure for us. She had been there before, had seen everything, done everything, super welcoming, super keen to pass the baton to the rookies, make sure that, you know, the Canadian astronauts do well, the new guys do well. And so she was, for us, particularly uh, a great model for this very tricky art of concealing uh, your work, your passion, your personal life. She is a champion in that art of make making it all happen and all successfully. So David is giving you kind of a sample of what we're going to see uh, in our next Governor General, but Jeremy as well, what did you think of the speech in there? Yeah, very moving. Uh, I'll, I'll just harken back to after I was selected as an astronaut, I remember watching Julie with a crowd early on and just being taken aback by how much she connected with people, people she'd never met before, but they were just on every word, listening to her, were, there was a strong connection there. And I felt that again today, where she's speaking to all of us across Canada and, and on behalf of the world, really. I was really, really impressed. Now, David, uh, what do you think is going to be more difficult, going to the International Space Station or being the Governor General? Oof, I don't know. We, <laughs> among astronauts, we like to say that you know, our job is life in the, in the fishbowl because we're always under scrutiny and always people are watching every move. But I think her new job is, is another step above uh, in terms of being there, out there, doing everything publicly and having to maintain super high standards. I mean, people's expectations on astronauts are high, but I think on government generals, even higher. And just quickly, I honestly don't have a lot of time, so what piece of advice would you give to Julie? Oh, just to be her, just like she was today. Just be the real authentic you. That's what Canadians want. David St. Jock and uh, Jeremy Hanson, I want to thank you for your time today here on Earth. Our pleasure. Thank, thank you. you, Hannah. <laughs> Rosie. Okay, thanks, Hannah. I appreciate that. I've met uh, Jeremy Hanson anyway, uh, and I, it's pretty cool to talk to astronauts. So the fact that we have a governor general who is also a former astronaut, and just a reminder of, of how difficult it is to be one. When she was selected to join the Canadian Space Agency back in uh, 1992, she was one of four people selected from 5,330 applicants. So in case you thought, A, no one wanted those jobs, or B, that they were easy to get, you're wrong. And here's our friend, uh, Tracy Ann 
Amber Stieg uh, from the ceremonial honor guard. Her dad wanted to make sure she got recognized today just as much as Julie Payette. So now we've, we've made both of them happy, hopefully, or, or, or Tracy will be mortified that her dad has emailed me uh, while on TV. So this part, uh, Philip Legacy, who joined, who's still with me here, is this is an important role, too, as, as uh, commander in chief and, and governor general, the inspection of the Royal Guard. Yes, indeed. So this is. Uh it really does signify the authority of the state over the military inspecting that honor guard. Um, civilian control of the military as well is tied into this. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's, a, as with many things surrounding the crown, I know people get fed up with me on Twitter no, about we this, don't. but we love it. That's there, why you're there here. are so many layers <laughs> to these relationships. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is really an opportunity for the armed forces to show themselves off. It's also an opportunity here, as we see for governors general and commanders in chief to speak to individual soldiers, know a little bit about mm -hmm. them. Um, and to, to build that connection between uh, the Commander-in-Chief and uh, members of the Canadian Armed Forces. And uh, was it was it Mikhail Jean who was the first to wear the uniform? I believe that was Jean Sauvé. It was Jean Sauvé. So that's that's not controversial. They are allowed to do that, or is it a little bit? Because I remembered some brouhaha around that. They're, it, they're allowed to, and it's it's established that they are. It's yeah. a special uniform made uh, special for the Governor General. Right. Uh, they have them for all three uh, services. Yeah. Uh, there is some controversy. Not everybody's happy with it, and yeah. uh, I can also say uh, quite clearly that there's a lot of controversy about precise what the commander-in-chief is. Right. Some people say it's a title, other people think it's an office, other people say it's a rank. Um, because it's quite different in this country versus the United States. Exactly, yeah. and yeah. my own interpretation for what it's worth is that Section 15 of the Constitution Act 1867 vests the power of commander-in-chief and queen, so supreme military command authority remains with Her Majesty, and that the queen therefore uh, creates the office of commander-in-chief uh, for the Governor General does not mean that the Governor General holds supreme military command authority. Right. And we know this because the Queen uh, commissions are still done in the Queen's name, so there's a personal relationship between officers and Her Majesty. Um, nonetheless, the Governor General uh, signs those commissions uh, as Governor General, not as Commander in Chief. So the Commander in Chief role really is more about uh, having a unified presence uh, around the military. Uh, and representing its service to the state through uh, through the crown. So it's not like she can order people to go into well, this combat. Is, well, you know, that's interesting that you bring that up. Yeah. Uh, there, there are some rumors, I won't name which governor general, but apparently uh -huh. during uh, one situation where apparently a governor general uh, saw something on TV and picked up the phone and called the CDS and told them to get ready to deploy. I don't know if this there's- This is recently? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if there's any- <laughs> <laughs> Any truth to that, but uh, since that, that would be a good one to nail down uh, if we yeah, could. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know, as with many of these things that happen at Rita Hall, all we hear are the whispers and, and rumors after the fact. But uh, <laughs> there's there's many many happenings that go on. In Cle this. Clearly, it didn't happen. So. It, I, I don't think it happened. I, okay. I, my sense is that the CDS probably then called the Minister of National yes. Defense. Wise, to, wise move. To to get a sense of uh, <laughs> what he should uh, should be doing. Oh my, that's funny. That said, you know, this is one of the risks that comes with this office. It's, yep. it's very important for governors general to, to know precisely what what they can and can't do. Uh, and when you do have these very strong personalities that are used mm -hmm. to being mm -hmm. at the top of their fields, that are used to uh, having a lot of power, oftentimes it's difficult to, to, to keep them within their box. And that can be frustrating for them. Yeah, that, that's an awfully good point because all of these people that we've seen in these different roles, uh, as you say, often top of their game, often very uh, assertive, confident people, which is what you would want in this role, and now um, having to play sort of a different function, yes, of, as you say, uh, with authority, but not necessarily the power. So so how do they walk that line, or where where is that line for them between you know, doing this job versus um, forcing the government's hand or trying to to do something that they just they just need to walk back a little bit. And who does that? Who says to them, no, no, back off a little bit. That's not your job. Well, primarily the the, the staff at Rita Hall. So one of the yeah. primary roles of the secretary of the governor general is to remind the governor general precisely what they can and cannot do. We don't expect this individual to, to be deeply wedded in all aspects of the office from the outset. No, of course not. There's no. institutional memory at Rideau Hall. Uh, some of the, the finest experts in the country uh, about the Crown are those that work in those offices, so they know it inside and out. Uh, similarly, the, the Governor General can have access to the Clerk of the Privy Council. The Clerk of the Privy Council, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> the clerk of the Privy Council uh, uh, 
will brief governors general on precisely the nature of their role. Right. And as you saw when uh, Prime Minister Krejci, the former Prime Minister Krejci, was, was being interviewed by, by Hannah, he made the point, the government decides. And ultimately, as hard as that may be for a very assertive governor general to, to yeah. know in certain cases, yeah. at the end of the day, they act on advice, except in two cases, dissolution and the appointment or dismissal of a prime minister. And even then, uh, the vice regals are usually acting on the, the nature of the House of Commons. So the, the degree of their discretion is quite narrow, uh, despite all the letters that they may get from MPs and Canadians across the country telling them to refuse royal assent or mm -hmm. to dismiss a prime minister or whatever it happens to be, that is not the nature of the job. And as a governor general, as a governor general, like I would sort of want to be thrust into those moments of, you know, those difficult moments, prorogation, dissolution. Those are the moments that you would sort of be tested in that role. But are most governor generals trying to avoid those potential um, moments of, of conf confrontation or conflict? Well, that's the other part of the office. Uh, really, in almost all cases, the governor general should allow some other institution to figure out the problem first. Right, right. So if it comes to whether or not a prime minister has the confidence of the House, your default position should always be to allow the House to es express itself yeah. first. You should not be dismissing a prime minister who hasn't formally lost confidence, for instance. And that's, for example, around the 2008 prorogation, had uh, Michael Jean refused Prime Minister Harper's advice, she would have effectively have uh, been dismissing him without his having formally lost confidence. So it's, uh, that, that's really quite problematic. So to the extent to which the Governor General can allow either the House of Commons and in other cases the courts uh, to, to deal with particular contentious mm -hmm. issues, it is always better for the Crown to act only if it absolutely must. This is, this is interesting because she's really spending quite a lot of time talking to people, obviously trying to build a bond right from the get-go. The, the most recent instance where I guess where we saw this uh, tested a little bit was in British Columbia, right. where there was a lot of questions around whether the lieutenant uh, governor there, general, uh, would, uh, would actually go ahead and allow them to test, uh, the Liberals to test whether they had confidence in the House or go ahead and dissolve the House and an election and in that instance I think everyone agreed that they did the right thing. Right well it, that's a, BC is a perfect example where there were a number of people saying well the lieutenant uh, general should uh, simply dissolve because the NDP government will never be able to hold confidence they're gonna have to name one of their own speaker. Yeah. Well lo and behold here we you are. Know, you waited yeah. it out and it didn't quite turn out that way. And for right, vice regals, they have to be, always be careful not to be second guessing the will of the legislature and not to, to think that they yeah. can uh, predict the future. It's yeah. always better to let uh, legislatures work things Try and out figure for it themselves. Out. I was just looking again through the notes that Rita Hall provided about um, ages, because this is, uh, Madame Payet is not the youngest governor general. The youngest was the Duke of Argyle, which is some time ago, <laughs> at 33. But Mikael Jean was actually uh, 48. Edward Shire was 43. So she's the third youngest governor general. It's sort of interesting because it is uh, a career that you would think sort of comes sort of at the end of your career. It's hard to know what you would imagine Madame Payette would do after. I mean, I don't think she'd have a hard time finding a job, but um, it, it's interesting to take this job now and then see what happens. Mikael Jean obviously has gone on to lead uh, La Francophonie in Paris, uh, so she's had a, a her career is prestigious and ongoing. I'll just dip in here and listen for a minute. You did so well. Thank you so much, everybody. I was, uh, I think it was, it just set the tone, especially uh, coming in into the Senate. A little bit hard to hear, but I, I do think I heard her, uh, Madame Payette, say that it was a little bit overwhelming. I can't imagine you're suddenly one day, you know, uh, driving your kid to school, and the next day you're sitting in basically a throne <laughs> with free jewelry being throne. given to you. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's it's pretty even for someone who's been to space. I would imagine that that the the, the prestige of the role is not is not lost on her today. No, and you can definitely hear she's thanking uh, the soldiers for, for being there um, and a uh, good deal of graciousness. And from here, there will be um, a little bit of a, a private um, private reception for uh, the new governor general. We'll should be able to mingle a little bit with uh, some members of the cabinet and other dignitaries, and one would expect these many guests as well that she has uh, 
brought in who are not able to be there for the ceremony because uh, space is quite limited, but uh, maybe she'll even venture over to the building, the Johnny McDonald building, which has been refurbished. It's just across the street from where she is to, to see some of her friends that she says has come from around the world to wish her well in this uh, new and exciting chapter of her career. Standing beside the Prime Minister there is uh, Judy Payette's son. Hooray! Okay, and that's the CF-18 uh, fly pass. Uh, some aircraft from Bagotville, Quebec. And the Governor General will now go back into Centre Block, the, uh, the main part of uh, the Parliament buildings there with the Prime Minister and her, and her son. And as I said, they'll have a bit of a reception in the Hall of Honour, which will be closed to media. So she can down tools a bit and relax. Um, she will eventually leave and head back uh, to uh, Rideau Gate. She'll also do... Um, head to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier later today. I think David Cochran is uh, still there at uh, Rideau Hall Gate, or Rideau Hall, standing by, waiting for now the return. Oh, he's at the War Memorial now. See, there you go. Uh, and that's where we will find the, the Governor General next. David Cochran, uh, sorry, I didn't realize you got to change locations. Lucky you. Tell me what uh, the Governor General will be doing next, then, from your perspective. Rosie, I tell you, I don't know if you could feel that the flyover that you just showed came right over us, and this place just absolutely shook. It was it was quite something. It was very thunderous here. A more somber and solemn event coming up, uh, at least tentatively, about an hour from now. Of course, at the National War Memorial, and what's going to happen is is Julia Payette will arrive and, and begin. She'll come here to the steps that lead up to the tomb of the unknown soldier. She'll be handed flowers, and she will hand those lay those flowers on the tomb of the unknown soldier. And then a Canadian Armed Forces piper is going to play the lament of the fallen and a moment of silence will be observed. I mean, in addition to the many, many things the governor general does, she is, of course, also the commander in chief of the military. So that's why we're seeing, I guess, the military presence and participation in this and this particular moment. And this will be the most public event of the day, Rosie, because after here, she gets into a car and she's escorted back to Rideau Hall for another uh, part of the process here, it's going to what will be her new home for the next several years, eventually. Uh, not right away, though. She's going to stay at Rideau Gate, we're told, until Governor General Dave, Governor former Governor General now, David Johnson, is going to take a while to get used to that, moves out. And they want to do some upgrades and repairs and, and sprucing things up, and then eventually Julia Payette will move in. So in a little over an hour, expect her to come here and, and pay respects and lay flowers on the tomb of the unknown soldier in what will be really the most public event of the day. I don't, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to start rumors, but uh, the former Governor General has a lot of grandkids, so I don't know what was happened inside Rideau Hall with all those kids running around all the time, but maybe there's some uh, puttying and repainting to do. <laughs> 
I just wonder if he's got to get some friends together and borrow a truck to move. I mean, that's what <laughs> I've had possible. to do in the past. Yeah. I suspect a former governor general might have a few more resources, though. We'll, we'll, we'll find <laughs> out if he needs a U-Haul. Okay, David, thanks for your coverage today. Appreciate it. That's the CBC's David Cochran okay. there from the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Let's head back. Uh, I believe she's still in the Senate chamber. There she is, Hannah Thibodeau, uh, with us for some final thoughts on the day today, Hannah. You certainly saw a lot of the dignitaries yes. uh, that were there, and those were just a few of the guests that Julie Payette brought with her um, for this big event today. You know, she's quite an impressive woman, uh, Rosie, and I think a lot of people, you know, you look at who you surround yourself with, and she surrounds herself with some pretty inspiring and amazing people. We had a chance to speak with fellow astronauts, and the kind words that came from them was quite inspiring. They were saying how she was such a good mentor, how they took, she took them under her wings when she was an astronaut in Houston to ensure that the rookie astronauts were, you know, okay heading out into space eventually, because the two gentlemen will eventually go into space to the International Space Station as well. But not only that, she stood in front of everyone in that chamber, and she did not have a note in her hand, and she spoke directly from the heart, and you could see that all of those dignitaries in that room were hanging on every single word that she said. She speaks six languages, and she opened up in Algonquin, and she wanted to make sure to say that she was saluting the indigenous nations. And she said that in Algonquin, and you could just see that the First Nations representatives in that room were extremely proud to have that moment as well. So, you know, she's an inspiring woman, she is a smart woman, and you can see that she does have a lot of respect from everybody in that room when it comes to her going down the road. And as we heard from Adrian Clarkson, a former governor general, she says it's a tough job, but she feels that she's got it well underhand. All right, Hannah, thank you for uh, your coverage and your welcome. great interviews today from up <laughs> there fun. as well. The CBC's Hannah Thibodeau from the Senate foyer on Parliament Hill. All right, uh, I'm going to bring in Phil Legasse for one last thought from him as we wrap up our coverage of the installation of the 29th governor general. Um, so it, 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 it's sort of cool to see where this is going to go and where she's going to take it, because it is a job that, yes, has specific sort of roles and duties, mm -hmm. but you can also sort of make it what you want it to be. Oh, absolutely. There's a good deal of charities that she can focus on, causes that she can mm -hmm. focus on. And similarly, she can craft the office um, to f fit the, the lifestyle that she needs uh, raising her son as well. So mm -hmm. the, that's going to be, uh, I think, an important precedent that she's going to set as well. Uh, if we want people with children or younger people yeah. Mothers. Uh, of our generation yeah. to come in, uh, just define what it is, what she is willing to do and the amount of time that she's willing to devote to it. I think that's going to be quite important. Similarly, I, I am looking forward to, I think, like most Crown observers, just to, to seeing to what extent she is able to... Uh, to meet with ministers, to meet with deputy ministers. Uh, we won't know any No, we won't know, I was going to say, yeah. Uh, it yeah. will be interesting to see, even in her public comments, will she be uh, somebody who's slightly more outspoken on the issues that she cares about, and given the force of her personality and how eloquent she is, mm -hmm. it is possible that we'll see a governor general who is uh, a little bit more outspoken. And that will be new uh, after seven years of uh, David Johnson, who played a very classic, yes. almost bedrock governor yeah. general role. Uh, but personalities change, and therefore practices change. And I think it's it's important to note that the crown, like all our political institutions, are constantly evolving, and personalities do matter in terms of what direction they take and how they change. And how do you think she will reflect the government's agenda? Um, because we did hear a lot of that today, and certainly that would have been a conversation that she would have had early on with the prime minister, I would think. Well, I, I would hope that she does not see herself merely as the government spokesperson. That's the role of ministers. That's the role of the mm -hmm. prime minister, and that part is in vain. What she can do is really she was selected because of who she is and what she's interested in. So she should express herself and and be herself uh, in terms of what she cares about. If that happens to mesh with the government's agenda, Excellent, great. Uh, but she shouldn't see herself really as a spokesperson for them to that extent. Obviously, when uh, they sent her abroad, which mm -hmm. is a, an increasingly large part of a governor general's role, the soft diplomatic role of doing uh, state visits and whatnot, in those contexts, there is something of an expectation that you're you're there as a representative of Canada and the, can and the government's foreign policy agenda. Mm -hmm. But uh, in uh, in other instances, she should uh, see herself as well as as having an independent office because the 
the Crown and the vice regal representation role is one that uh, shouldn't be seen as distinct from the government of the day. That's quite important for what it is. Now, of course, that gets blurred sometimes sure. with things like speeches from the throne. But nonetheless, outside of those very strict constitutional bounds, she uh, occupies the second highest office of the state, and uh, let's see what she does with it. Okay, Phil Legacy, thank you. Appreciate it very much. I was glad you were here to correct me many, many times <laughs> throughout only, the course of once. these three hours. Only once. <laughs> Phil Legacy is the Barton Chair at the Normanson Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, my alma mater. Thank you for your time. I do appreciate it very much. And thank you uh, to our reporters in the ground, Hannah Thibodeau and David Cochran, to our control room, who's been working uh, throughout the day on this. And a special thank you to Tom Dinsmore. He's a man many of you may not know. He's uh, one of the pool producers, producer extraordinaire, who's helped CBC with its coverage for many decades. Uh, Any time the national or other specials have happened around the world and throughout this country. It's Tom's last uh, moment producing something on the air for us. He will be much missed. We're not sure how we'll do it without him, but we'll figure it out. We'll have complete coverage of all the day's activities tonight on The National, of course, at 9 p.m. Eastern on CBC News Network and CBC uh, at 10 p.m. local. CBC Radio will have lots more coverage on The World at 6. If you want a recap of how the day unfolded or this morning unfolded, cbcnews.ca right now. Uh, and ongoing coverage of anything else about Canada's new Governor General. That's us for it for us here in Ottawa. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and thanks to everybody for watching. It's been nice to be back on TV. Maybe they'll let me on again. <laughs> Thanks for watching. And uh, you can watch more coverage of this later today on Power and Politics. Here's a look at some of the moments from this morning as Judy Payette became Canada's 29th Governor General. Thanks for watching. Julie Payette solemnly affirm that you will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Je l'affirme solennellement. Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Julie Payette. has no limit. À la vie qui nous unit. Merci.